Welcome to Making the Argument. And last week, if you were with us, we discussed what the country might look like if the left won. And what we meant by that is we took kind of like the the political ideology and philosophy of people like Elizabeth Warren, AOC, Bernie Sanders, and we said, okay, if that became so dominant within American politics that they could essentially do whatever they want, what would that look like for the economy? What would it look like for taxes? What would it look like for education or the military or foreign policy or energy? And so we went through that. And now there might be some people who say, yeah, but you only pick like the extreme left wing of the party. And the reason why we chose to go with that is because Joe Biden probably represents what you would consider to be the moderate wing of the Democratic Party. And yet, if you look at the policies that he's implementing, the things that he's saying, the events that he's hosting, you're not going to see a great deal of moderation with respect to policy. So that's why we focused on that wing of the left party, because we believe it's in the ideological ascendancy. Well, today... We're going, to look, we're going to look at what would the country look like if the right won. However, I think there's a little bit more of a debate going on within the right. Christian may disagree with some of this on what direction the party should go. So we're going to look at the different paths, right? The different paths, the, the kind of the battle, the ideological battle that's going on with the Republican Party. And what would it mean if those different groups took over? All that and more coming up on this episode of Making the Argument. It is a pleasure to have you all here, and thank you to everyone who joined us on Tuesday. If you haven't had a chance to watch that episode, maybe, you know, we're live now, so maybe go back and watch Tuesday's episode after we're done. But if you haven't already, head down to the link in the description and join our community chat. These episodes have been inspired by our community, and we're so thankful for the folks who have given us these ideas in the Episodes Idea channel, and that has really been fantastic. So, Nick, I'm going to hand it right over to you. All right. I am your host, Nick Freitas, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, but other than that, a reasonably good guy most days. With us today, or actually, I should say not with us today, is uh, my beautiful bride, Tina, queen of the bees. She's a little bit under the weather, which, by the way, I think is a stupid phrase, under the weather. I don't know, but it's, I don't know, it's just commonly used. So she, well, she more accurate than over the weather. That's true. That's true. I don't know. I'm here, by the way. I think it's dumb. Oh, yeah, Christian's here. <laughs> Our resident historian and political prognosticator, Christian Hines. Say hi, Christian. Say again. Now that I, I've I, I did you. just say I'm here. All right, Hello. But it was after the, all right, hi, and then, of course... Of course, our producer of producers, Nicholas Hamilton, the good Hamilton, the one that doesn't like central banking. That's right. Christian's camera looks good now. Sorry, guys. Oh, gosh. Uh, his camera I, looked bad. Did they, it was just out of focus. Us? Oh, sometimes the oh that's probably a good now. thing. Um, <laughs> I, look, I look better on the blurred version. <laughs> Keep telling you, like, give me those filters. that. <laughs> you know those filters in like the documentaries where it's like the, the person's like shaded out and then they use like some voiceover thing to yeah. like muffle their voice for like national security <laughs> reasons? They need to do that. Hamilton, you need to do that to me in future episodes. We get, we get I don't know that we could do that during right. a live stream. <laughs> <laughs> but um, today is an interesting um, topic that I think a lot of us have been waiting for. I know a lot of our audience members have been waiting for it. This, is, this was like a widely requested topic on um, basically like, you know, what, what would it look like if the right wins? And obviously the right is a very diverse collection of people because let's be honest, Nobody thinks that Jeb Bush and Donald Trump share much in common other than the R next to their name. Yeah. Right. Well, so, and, and when, and that's the, there's a lot that, of ground to cover. Yeah. We, we see this, this is going to be a little bit more in, in depth with kind of establishing what right are we talking about? Like one of our, one of our audience members said that off the bat, he goes, well, this completely depends on what right you're talking right. about. I don't think, again, I don't think the same ideological fight is happening in the left as much. I think it's more of a question of, of speed uh, with which it takes place. But, and, and yeah, and to be fair there, yes, there are people who are elected Democrats and whatnot who are not, they're not socialists or they're not like that. However, they seem to be getting drowned out by the people that really are. And, Consider to, yesterday's primary elections well, they in seem Virginia. To, they seem to go along with it whenever they can. Yeah, and you look at the primary elections here in Virginia. If you were a moderate Democrat, you um, lost in Virginia, last night. You lost. You or, lost. Sorry, two nights ago. Yeah, yeah. You you lost on Tuesday. I mean, they they were going any any Democrat up there to include ones that have been incumbents forever. Um, we're 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 getting either. Th there was one exception to it, and it was simply because he had a huge two reasons, I think, that, that Cray Deeds beat Sally Hudson, and barely he barely, barely beat, beat Sally Hudson. Sally Hudson was a delegate. She's a professor out of um, UVA in Charlottesville. Cray Deeds is long-term incumbent senator that has always represented, you know, the, you know or for a long time represented that portion of Albemarle County and all that, but there's a large rural portion of that district, and it was the it was the more rural Democrats that kind of pushed crazy. He got blown out of the water in Charlottesville. Oh yeah, absolutely and also crushed. every single Republican under this. I actually know some Republicans that 
that crossed over to vote for him. And usually the GOP dissuades people from doing that because it's like, oh, you might not be eligible to vote in a future Republican contest. Yeah. But the ones that lived in Albemarle or Charlottesville, mostly Albemarle, of course, or Amherst, um, they, they voted for Creed Deeds because they're like, well, no Republican's going to win this district. So it's not like I'm giving up much by voting in the Democrat primary anyway. I think that Cree only won because he had a base of rural support that could yeah. offset Charlottesville. And he had immense crossover support from Republicans. You remove either of those two factors and he would have lost. And he oh, was, yeah. by the way, Barely the only quote unquote moderate. And by the way, Cree is very... Yeah, he's, to the he's left, still very right? left but wing. He's yeah. the only quote unquote moderate who won his primary on Tuesday in, yeah. in Virginia. Every other Lionel lost to Louise Lucas, yeah. George um George Barker, Barker lost. lost. Um Jeremy McPike looks like he might lose to, to Elizabeth, Elizabeth Guzman. Guzman. That's going down to the wire. Um Joe Morrissey lost, Chap Peterson lost, which was honestly devastating because Chap actually was a moderate on yeah. a few issues. Yeah. He was definitely to the left on others, but like one of the literally probably the probably the only old school Democrat that was left in the entire legislature. He, he was the, he was the only one. And, and keep in mind when we say moderate, that means that <laughs> that means on, on, on issues of any substance, um, Chap Peterson and I voted the same way, maybe 15, 20% of the time. And, and that and might usually, be generous. And usually what it was on was property rights issues. Cause, cause he was, he was really good. good on I remember when you carried he was a good bill, on property rights. Um, when, when Nick carried a bill, um, to, to limit things like, um, Oh no, no, let me, let me go specific on this. I carried a bill that said that before the government shows up and takes your property through eminent domain, they've got to notify you so that you can challenge it. And it was crazy because I want this was under I think the McAuliffe administration might have been under Northam, but I, I remember I, in, sitting in the committee meeting when this happened. It was so funny. Oh, I we I watched everybody from the government get up. Uh, 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 I think almost every Democrat voted against it except for Chap and maybe one other person. But but they were saying, well, this this could have a, a undue expense on on the agencies when we go to and and Chap looks at me and goes like, what's the undue expense? Twenty eight cents for a stamp? Like what? What's the un like he was actually willing to hold his own administration because it was a Democrat administration accountable and say, no, you, you're going to notify I someone remember before what he you said, take their I've stuff. I've got a solution for you, buddy. Take a, st um, you know, take your, your, um, uh, eminent domain notice, stick it in an envelope and shove it in someone's mailbox and call it a day. <laughs> and then he was like, you know, motion to pass. And then yeah. and that was like the end of the debate right <laughs> well, there. The last thing I'll say on the whole moderate thing was, is that, to Chap's credit, he did lead the charge on the Democrat side to reopen schools in Virginia. Yeah, he did. When nobody else in his party was willing yeah. to do it. And we needed somebody in the Senate to do it because the, the Senate was controlled by Democrats. And if it wasn't for Chap, we wouldn't have gotten schools reopened when it did happen. Yeah. So I'm I'm very grateful for him for that. Um, uh, you know, he, he represented a deep blue district. We were never going to get a Republican in that yeah. seat. And he did a good job considering the district that he was in. It, for, for for the time that he was in oh, office, I, by the same token, he carried the leg he carried the second chance legislation, which was not. Let's just say the stuff that like Trump carried that was a little bit controversial for for conservatives, but was you know making taking a stab at some I, I think some necessary elements within criminal justice reform, even though there were some problems with it. I mean, the, the second chance. I, I mean, this was something where they were like automatically reconsidering uh, sentencing for murderers, and we're all looking at Chap like. Jeez, like it was so left wing. The Democrats in the House voted against it in the committee, like after <laughs> wow. testimony. Like it was incredible. Uh, he also carried the legislation to essentially uh, allow you to sue gun manufacturers. Yeah, I remember and, that. And I know because it came before my subcommittee. Oh no, no, no. He look, he so, was he but, was but very left wing. The on point certain I'm things. making, the point I'm making is, is that this is what we mean by a moderate Democrat. We right. mean someone that believes that it was perfectly appropriate for you to get 28 days notice before they confiscated your property. Right, we're we're not talking about. I mean, he still carried very very left wing. And two years into the pandemic, finally recognizing we need to reopen the schools. But, That's but, what we mean by moderate. But but, but he was always your, a, he was always a gentleman. He was always reasonable. Um, to to you know, your point about things. the right, on 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 the right though, I I think that in some ways there's a lot more diversity. Consider the fact that in in our state legislature, there's well a lot of these people that were very far on the right lost their their primaries. But but in in I would argue that in the Republican Party in Virginia and in other states, the right is more ideologically diverse than the left. I tend to believe that. Now, Nick, correct me if I'm wrong. Today, we're not asking the question of can the right win, but nope. if the right won, if the what right would won. that look like? Wait, if the right won, and here's the three kind of versions of the right. Let's go ahead and get into this. The three versions of the right. One is kind of what you might call more right-wing populism. Okay. 
and and I'm I'm not saying this is a pejorative. I, I'm saying that it it's more right wing populist. What what does that mean? Um, I think this is more of kind of like the the Trump wing of the party. Um, so it 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 has a a lot. It has very very strong what we might call traditional conservative uh, notions. Um, it is it is certainly willing to use the government to achieve certain things. Like I'll give you an example of this. You know Donald Trump has. And Donald Trump has on his issues page a thing that says that he wants to require a system where parents get to elect the principal. Now, sounds great in theory. A lot of a lot of people on the right wing populist side would say yes, absolutely, because we have all these problems within our public schools. A lot of your more a lot of your more um, like strict constitutionalists would say, whoa, 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 wait a second. This is not the realm of the federal government. We we might like where you're going with this, but it's still not the the realm of federal jurisdiction, right? But so right wing populism is still a little bit. It's still more apt to use the government in order to achieve things that they think are good for right wing objectives, right? So that's the right wing populism. Uh, again, still strong elements of traditional conservatism. Then you have what I I would call I would still call the Bush or maybe the Bush Romney wing of the party. Um, and, and this is what, you know, sometimes gets referred to as establishment Republicans. Um, this is, is much more of your, your moderate kind of, I, I would argue big government Republicanism. So George Bush, you know, did some of the, the biggest expansions of the government under no child left behind under things like Medicaid part D creating a new entire, an entirely new federal department, yeah, de- Homeland de- security, department of Homeland security that, that was, you know, Patriot act. Yeah, yeah, the Patriot Act, all that stuff. The, these were all, you know, so where, where this differs. The bailouts in 2008, that's the last point. Yeah, where, where this differs is um, it, it's there's some crossover between that uh, with respect to the using the government to achieve certain ends. It's just that most of your most of the people in the Bush-Romney camp, um, I, I'm, tr- I'm trying to say this without being like overly pejorative, they, they've, they've kind of given in to a lot of the, the narrative on the left, um, but they want to do it more reasonably, right? They, they want to be, I used to refer to them as they want to be the more reasonable conductors of the train wreck, <laughs> you know, it's a better way of describing don't, it. Don't put it in, in full, full blast, right? It's, it, it, this is what people mean when they say conservatism is progressivism driving the speed limit. Yeah. The, 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 the Bush Romney camp of the Republican party want to move this country to the left at the speed limit, whereas large portions of the Democratic Party want to break the speed limit and go 100 miles an hour so, on a 25 mile an hour road. So this is where I'm going to slightly disagree with you. I don't think that they I don't think that everybody that would be part of like the Bush Romney coalition necessarily wants to move the country more left. I I think they're incapable of stopping it. I, I think what they they believe in, like they have this version of, quote, conservatism, which is this idea that, well, if the people really want to do something, well, then the best way to do it is kind of slowly over time to let it be more established and be reasonable and take into account, you know, existing institutions and, and things like that. What, what it is is that they're not necessarily standing in the way of those things happening. It's just more of, well, if these things are going to happen, then then here's the the slow, reasonable, you know, way that it should happen. And it's same token they might they might argue for things on the other side like for instance they might yeah we want tax cuts because we believe you know we fundamentally believe capitalism is good but yeah we understand that there's problems and we've got to have safety net so that that's the area that they get into the problem is i think that the the romney bush went wing always ends up losing in the compromise right they're always the first to show up to the compromise uh, table and then they're always the first to compromise on things fundamentally and then they'll come back and say well we got half of what we wanted no you permit you prevented half of what they wanted by giving them the other half, and and so that's and and the left doesn't have to win, they don't have to win at a hundred percent every single time. No, any they compromise, win at one percent, they've made an advancement. Yes. C- consider this: any co- any compromise with the left equals a win for the left. The left wants one hundred percent of something, even if you give them one percent of what they want, that is still a shift to the left. Whereas the right, by definition, conservatism is in some ways a philosophy that that simply seeks to preserve the status quo, not necessarily radically change or shift the country in another direction. This is why they say Cthulhu always swims to the left or the <laughs> Leviathan always swims to the left, because I, I, I've put I brought this up before in previous 
podcast. And I kind of want to want to ask the question in, in like a, a full format because it actually relates to the topic for today. Of the four major Republican electoral victories yeah. in your lifetime, three of which took place in my lifetime, they were Ronald Reagan in 1980. You could also argue his re-election in 84. Yeah. The 1994 Republican Revolution, the um, 2010 Tea Party wave, mm -hmm. and the 2016 Trump election. Yeah. If you look at the year before these supposed massive right-wing shifts in the electorate, yeah. right? So you look at 1979, 1993, 2009, and 2015. Ask yourself, of any of those four years, is the United States in 2023 more to the left or right of any of those four years? Oh, there's no there's no question it's more to the left. And and that's where, again, I think part of the problem has been there's the right has, has tried to translate political victory into cultural victory and that is not the same thing explain why that's not the same thing that's interesting it's it, so the, the old buckley quote was um politics is downstream from culture which is to say that you, you know you can have whatever people you want running things but if the culture you know it, it and, and really what he means by the culture it's it's the major culture shaping institutions within our society so these are things like the family the church hollywood the news academia education all of these things, arts and entertainment, all of these things are culturally shaping institutions. Well, most of those institutions are are dominated more by the left than they are by the right, especially the educational institutions, right. uh, perhaps more than any, any anything else. I mean, you could argue arts and entertainment as well, um, but uh, those are those are predominantly left wing, and and so. Obviously, your electorate over time is going to be more left wing if the culturally shaping if the culturally shaping institutions are left wing, and so okay, you can get a Republican elected, but if that Republican, you know, ten years from now looks like a Democrat fifteen years ago, right. okay, they're still winning the overall argument, right? That's that's the thing. So let's or so let, let's uh, we got the kind of the right wing populism with some of the traditional conservatism. We've got the kind of like moderate version of conservatism within the Romney Bush coalition. And then you have what what I would call the the Liberty Wing, mm -hmm. and the Liberty Wing is is more of your Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, right? Um, you know, you you have some other guys that that kind of fit into that from uh, time to time. You know, Chip Roy, yeah, um, stuff like that. Ted but, Cruz occasionally, yeah, Ted Ted Cruz, but again, there that's not, occasionally, yeah. It, it's one well, again, and, and it's like some of these people I know, like I know Ted Cruz, I right. know Chip Roy, like they're I, I, good I, people, yeah, good people. I know, oh, Rand my, my, I know Mike Thomas Lee would Massey. be another addition. Mike Lee that. would be in the Liberty. So if you want the the firm Liberty camp, right? So there's there's allies, right? That kind of you know sometimes between more the right wing traditional populism and then the um, and then the Liberty wing. But the the guys that I think are pretty firmly in the Liberty camp would be your Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, uh, Mike Lee for the most part. Um, yeah, I would say definitely Mike Lee. Yeah. Th this is your Liberty wing. Um, and, and what that looks like is, is I would argue, you know, some people say that, you know, they're, Hey, they're more libertarian overall. What, what I think is different from like the Ron Paul, Rand Paul Massey from like your big L libertarian is that there's certain issues where they don't side with the big L libertarian party. And and it's a it's a big it's a significant enough difference to to call it something else. That's why I call it kind of the the liberty right. wing. Um, but what the liberty focuses on is the idea that when when they read the Constitution and they see Article One, Section Eight, the very very specific enumerated powers of the federal government, they see a great idea. They don't see something that was a great idea in in you know the 1780s. They see a great idea right now. And they're able to very effectively and I think philosophically articulate that position. The problem is, is that there aren't a lot of them. There's a lot more. They're the smallest. They are the smallest of, of the of the three that we're discussing. Um, and and so inevitably, what ends up happening is to get things done, they end up kind of working with different groups on different th uh, things, and then th they'll sometimes get labeled as traitors over, I, I think, rather stupid things from time to time. Um, but then you you do have other people that literally go off the reservation. So. It when the Liberty Wing looks at the Constitution and they see a good idea when the Constitution was written and a good idea today, that's yeah. re that's termed an originalist, right? And that's a little bit different. Originalism is more of like a, a legal term with respect to understanding how to interpret the Constitution okay. in legal matters. So that's more of a, a Justice Scalia um, a, approach to it, which I, I think was great. But um, so that that's kind of the three groups that we're looking at, right? So you've got 
kind of the, the traditional conservative slash right wing populist. You've got the more moderate, you know, Romney Bush coalition. And then you've got the Liberty uh, group. The, these are the three versions of the right. So the question would be like, if we look at economics and, and one of the questions that we asked before is, okay, what would it, you know, what would starting or running a business look like? And I would say under, under more of the right wing populace, um, there would be significantly fewer regulations, significantly fewer regulations, much easier to start a business. Um, however, there would be more interference with, with respect to international trade. Um, because the, the, the right wing populist side is very, very skeptical of trade deals and understandably so. So they wouldn't consider themselves to be free trade. They would consider themselves to be fair trade. Um, now they're, now they're much more comfortable with tariffs. Yeah. They're much more comfortable with tariffs because they, they see tariffs as being kind of a, a patriotic response, uh, to bad trade deals in some cases, but in other cases like Pat Buchanan, um, he just viewed tariffs as a positive thing because it would help American industry if they weren't competing with overseas companies. Um, you know, so th that's the area where I think domestically you would find it very easy to start a business. Your taxes would be low. However, if your business was in some way reliant upon foreign trade, you would probably see some difficulties there. Now I, I will give, I will give Trump as due on this. Um, there are some things that Trump did with tariffs that I thought were were bad economic decisions. There was other ones where he was using tariffs as a tool in order to get to the other side to come back to the negotiating table and give a more reciprocal trade deal. And that's why when he talks about reciprocal trade, I think he has a point. Uh, the thing I the thing I always worry about though is is harnessing this energy. Um, which says that tariffs are a good thing for the economy. No, tariffs are not. Tariffs are not, people believe that tariffs are a tax on foreign goods and, and services or a tax on foreign company. No, they're not. They're a tax on you because when you go to buy those goods and services, you're now paying more than you otherwise would. All right. Now, when it comes to like the, the Bush Romney side, their position, I think they're is free just been traders a, mostly. Well, they are and they aren't. I, I think, I think what they are is they're, they're free traders uh, but they're they, definitely they're, they are, but they aren't. They are horrible negotiators. Like if if you believe in free trade, you should be fighting for you should be fighting for the sort of reciprocal trade. And and I, I won't even call it that because I don't think that's a good term either. The the best trade ideal is I don't got any restrictions on you, and you don't got any restrictions on me, and then we trade where it makes sense for us to trade. Also, it's worth noting that they're not. They they have this persona of being very like pro business, which by the way I think is different from being pro free market. Um, but it's worth noting that that George Bush actually raised tariffs on steel. Yeah. And so, yes, there is this element within the Bush Romney coalition that is is usually pro free trade, but they're they also dabble in protectionism every now and then with certain key industries. Now, their default would be different than than the the um, you know Trump or populist wing of the party, and that the populist wing of the party, their default is I support protectionism unless you can convince me otherwise. Yeah. The Bush Romney coalition's response to this is usually I support free trade unless you can convince me otherwise. And you can, again, in, in this case, Bush did raise tariffs on steel. Well, but here's what example. I say. The, the difference is, is that I don't, I think they, <laughs> I, I think that they can be convinced away from free trade for practical political reasons. Not to mention the fact that I also think that they believe in free trade very, very selectively. Because if you look at things like NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, that was not a free trade agreement in the way that most people would imagine a free trade agreement would look. They would imagine free trade is I don't put tariffs on your goods and you don't put tariffs on our goods. We don't yeah. put restrictions on your goods. You don't put restrictions on our goods. That is not what NAFTA did, right? It was it was very selective with respect to how it laid out the regulations, how it re, re, laid out other restrictions. And, and lo and behold, it benefited certain industries in the United States at the expense of other ones. And one of my biggest problems with the, what I call the, you know, the more, again, the Bush-Romney coalition is that there doesn't seem to be a, a guiding like economic principle pushing this decision. It, it's more of, well, what seems to be the best for, you know, big business in America because the business of America is Speaking, business. Let me jump in with a question right here from the audience. Tiger says, how do you combat cheap labor in manufacturing sent overseas? So this is, this is a very interesting question. And, and what you need to understand, and I think what is important to understand about the economy as a whole is we want, everybody wants the best deal possible for them, for themselves. Now, 
my, my daughter actually said this really, really well when she was taking a test once and she got a question that she didn't understand. And she goes, Daddy, I don't know this question. They're asking me which countries should trade with one another. I said, well, what don't you understand? She goes, countries don't trade with one another. People in countries trade with one another. And I was like, well, first of all, sweetheart, however you answer that, um, you're right and the test is wrong. But it, it's important to realize that there are going to be times where people in different countries have competitive advantages. And so, for instance, if, if one economy is, is at a state where – they can produce, let's say, textiles, T-shirts, things like that. They can produce them much cheaper than we can in the United States. Well, the first question that we should ask ourselves is, why can they do it much cheaper? If the answer is, well, they're willing to work for less because they don't need to make as much in order to you know, feed their family and their economy, and, oh, by the way, it's, it's not because of government regulations or tariffs or taxes. It's just because th there's a different competitive advantage there. That's not necessarily a bad thing if we allow a, a, a different economy to focus on a particular good or service that they can do at, at a better rate. Now, some people say, well, what does that do to like American jobs within that particular field? It basically takes them away. Now, people look at that and say, well, isn't that a bad thing? <laughs> okay, well, let me ask you this. Do you make your own clothes? Do you fix your own car? Do you do your own medical? No. What do you do? You trade with other people. You find the thing within the economy that you're the best at doing and that you can maximize the value for your labor on, and then you go do that thing. And then instead of trying to do everything really well, you focus on the things you do really well, and then you trade with other people to do those other things really well. And that's why transaction takes place. And, and the more complex and the more specialized an economy gets, typically the more productive it becomes and, and the lower you know prices that you have and the more abundance of goods that you possess. So the, this is what they call the creative destruction component. So if there's, if there's artificial government things standing in the way, then the first thing to do is to remove those. But it's important to understand that engaging in exchange from one person to another person, whether that's in the same town, in the same state, in the same country, or on the same continent, or somewhere else in the globe, provided that it's voluntary and there's as little government intervention as possible, you're far more likely to actually get a positive outcome from that exchange. So it's not a good idea for us to tell our kids, hey, we're going to raise a bunch of tariffs and we're going to put in a bunch of regulations so we can protect a particular job that Americans are no longer competitive at. That is not healthy because what will end up happening eventually is either the tariffs go away or technology changes and that job goes away. And what we've done is we've given our kids a false sense of security in an industry they shouldn't be going into instead of having the marketplace accurately project what's going on so that they can make the best decisions possible to go into the fields that are going to be more economically competitive for Americans in the future. So I hope that answers that question. That was a good response. I, I know that we need to finish the the Liberty Wing take on yes. this. I, I, after we're done with that, in terms of economics, w w would you be willing to briefly talk about like the difference between the three of these groups and their relationship to like the business community yes, or, yeah. or, 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 or their position on like monetary or fiscal policy? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, uh, so the third one on the Liberty side with economics, what would it be like to start a business? Incredibly easy. So the, the other two groups, I don't think they would do a whole lot with like licensure requirements. I don't think they would do a whole lot with um, you know, certification requirements, the Liberty wing of the party would actually look at a lot of your licensure and say, I don't know why this exists. Right. Like what, why do you, why do you have to have a license right to do someone's nails? Why do you have to have a license to be a florist? Right. These are things that would all be eliminated within a Liberty version of the economy. So it would be incredibly easy to run a business. Now, when it came to things like foreign trade, they would also be very, very hands off. Um, but to the extent that they would involve themselves, I think what you would see is it was a, it would be a push for the least amount of taxes or regulations possible. That would always be the goal, always be the goal. But they would they would largely leave it up to individual businesses and whatnot to negotiate their their own trade arrangements. And they would only involve themselves when it came to pushing back against foreign governments, essentially trying to, again, raise tariffs or, or putting on restrictions. Um, and, and to, to Christian's point, re repeat your question again on that one. What is the difference between the three factions on the right on the question of like, say government's relationship with the business community? So, so I, I you think, know, like wall street, Silicon Valley, yeah, that type of stuff. I think the right, I think right wing populism is very pro American business. So, which is to say that they would attempt to use the government to try to give American businesses a competitive advantage. 
Now, that sounds really good, right? That, that, that sounds positive to most people. Why wouldn't we want Americans to have a competitive advantage? And, and the problem is, is that government involvement doesn't necessarily guarantee an advantage. In fact, in most cases, what it does is it creates systemic problems within the economy to where you're not propping up American businesses, you're propping up certain American businesses at the expense of other American businesses, right? But so that's the pro and con. But I, I think overall right-wing populists look at it as if you're an American with a business, we want to make sure that, you know, you, you're, you're competitive. The Bush-Romney one, I think, is far more... Um, far more susceptible to cronyism, I feel like. I think they absolutely, like, I, I think they see cronyism as a, as a positive thing in the world. Um, and they're, they're very, very in favor of big business. Yes. Now they, they will, they will give a lot of, you know, they'll talk about small business all day long, but they will be happy to manipulate the currency. They will be happy to yep. manipulate the regulatory environment in order to support, you know, businesses, which they see as being critical to the overall economy. And so they, they will constantly intervene in ways that support those businesses, which they, they label as being strategic or essential to the economy as a whole. And, and the problem with that is that once you go down that path, you can now justify tariffs, you can justify subsidies, you can justify regulations, you can do any of it because after all, it's helping business. The problem that I have with all of this is like, no, you're helping certain businesses, specifically the businesses with the best lobbyists. At the, at the disadvantage of other businesses. Or the businesses that issue the most campaign funds. Yeah. The, the, the last point is pretty straightforward. Like the, the Liberty Wing is very pro-free market and that is different than being pro-business, right? It's it's yeah. a hands-on, it's a laissez-faire approach. Yes. It's, the Liberty Wing is the only wing that has anybody in it that even knows what Austrian economics is, yeah. you know, let, let alone yeah. all the different, you know, facets of it. Now, I think that there are elements within the Liberty Wing that are more, um, more partial to the Chicago school yeah, than the Milton Austrian Friedman. school. But yeah. the fact that they know the difference between those two, because the Bush Romney <laughs> wing is, has effectively bought hook, like a hook, line and sinker into Keynesianism. The, the mean part of me wants to say the populist wing doesn't even understand what we're talking about right now. I don't think that. Um, I, I think that there's an element of truth <laughs> no, to no, that. No, here, here's what I'll say. I, I, I think that, by the uh, way, to your point about you saying that, um, that, that the, um, populist wing is more, um, pro-American business. I think there's also a side of the populist wing that is actually anti-American business right now because they view American businesses as basically being an, an extension of the DNC. I, I think I think they're and of uh, pushing leftists. I think they're far more likely to break down their 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 favorability of businesses based off of the the overall corporate values. And so I I don't I don't disagree with you on that. I think there's a lot of I think a lot of people on the right wing populist side that would would go after. Um, American businesses, which they believe are pushing things which are detrimental to America. I, I, the, the, the number one feature that I, I think they would describe, excuse me, their, their position as is um, economic patriotism, right? So if, if you're an American business, which is supporting American values, well, then they want to help you. And if you're a business that is competing with that American business, they want to do something to thwart you. And if you're an American business, which is actually hurting American values, they see you more as a traitor. I mean, look at how DeSantis treated Disney, right? Yeah. Or or how Republican governors in certain states are treating like BlackRock and some yeah. of these like Wall Street firms or the response to a lot of these Silicon Valley tech companies that quite frankly have a very clear bias in favor of the left and their operations. I, I think they're I think they're a lot more willing to fight fire with fire in the economy. They see the left wing, they see left wing populism and left wing progressivism and wokeism and whatever you want to call it. They see them as saying, well, they're going to support businesses provided that the businesses support their ideological agenda. And the right wing populist side is like, well, fine, if this is the way the game is going to be played, let's play it, baby. Right. Like that's their that's their approach. I tend to be more of the side where it's like, OK, I understand what you're doing and I understand the motivation for it. Um, and there's even times where I'm looking at it going, <laughs> I'm smiling, <laughs> but I, I also see that there's some, I think there's some fundamental flaws in that, that approach because ultimately it still puts the same entity back in power of the economy. And that's the government. Now it's just a question of which side is going to control that entity right. as it attempt. Whereas, whereas my, I tend to go more with the, the Liberty wing, which is to say, 
No, the solution for this is not one side or the other side to control the economy through political power. The, the solution is for people to recognize that this is a crappy way to try to control the economy yeah. and that the, the way that you actually get better economic development is through the maximizing of, of individual liberty, individual choice, property rights, free market exchange. The government should not be tipping the scales and picking winners and losers, right? That's, that's a model that the, the liberty side would argue that's a model that always over time benefits the left, right? Always over time benefits. The left. So that's kind of the three. Let me, let me that, jump. Nick, I got a yeah. quick question here from Harrison Morgan, and I think this is really interesting. Would the deficit decrease if the right won? And I want to get your thoughts on how each of these sectors would approach the deficit problem. I think the deficit, I think under the Liberty side, absolutely. <laughs> like you put Rand Paul and Thomas Massey and Mike Lee and Chip Roy, you put guys like that in charge of looking at the budget. Yes, the deficit drops significantly. But one of the reasons why they've never been able to accumulate sufficient political power to be able to do this is because you can't do that without major restructuring of the way the government spends money. And, and the dirty little secret in Washington, D.C. is nobody ever lost an election for spending too much. But you can lose an election for cutting spending. And this is one of the reasons why I think to Christian's point, he believes that the Leviathan always swing, swims left is because if, if one person is fighting for your right to be able to live your life the way that you want, to be able to assume risk, to be able to do things, but you've also got to take personal responsibility for your actions, right? That's not as enticing as someone saying, vote for me and I will give you this. Not to mention the fact that once it's vote for me and I will give you this, now anybody that says we can't afford this is running on a thing of I'm going to take away the thing you've been given. That is a wildly unpopular position to take in, 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 a, in, a, in a democracy, right? People we, we don't want to have their stuff taken away. I, the, 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 I mean, the, the phrase that I, that I like using on this is any politician that, that's, that's thrifty with taxpayer funds will soon find their way out of office yeah. in short order. I mean, they're, they're, look, at the, look at the trajectory of the – I mean, the, the other two wings of the party, the populist and, and you know, Bush-Romney wing of the party, establishment wing, whatever you want to call it, like they both have – because they have both been in power before. Yeah, Trump has been president before. Bush has been, in, uh, oh gosh, you know, was yeah. president before. I mean, some of the largest increases in federal spending in American history have taken place under those two administrations. Oh yeah, and and under Reagan. If and we're, under if Reagan, being, Reagan had huge. Now the, Reagan. Reagan just, was different. It was all on the military. Yeah, to win the Ra Cold War. Reagan justified the deficit spending in large part because of of winning the Cold War. And and look, I think you can make an argument on some way that. <sighs> strategic investment in defense spending that really caused the Soviets to, to kind of realize that their economy couldn't keep up with ours, uh, that you could, you can argue you, there's a limited argument for the value on that. The, the overall problem though, is that people like Dick Cheney said, well, Reagan proved deficits don't matter. No Dick. He didn't. <laughs> <All right? laughs> deficits still matter. So the, the last question that I want to ask you, and this is tangentially related to Hamilton. Well, wait, wait, before you, I need to finish this one. So the Liberty guys would reduce it significantly. Oh, okay. The moderates would increase it. And, and I, I honestly think the, the, the right wing populist side, I think it, I don't know. It's I, it not would, a priority. It, it's not a priority. It would, it would entirely depend. Um, there was certain things that I think, yeah, I, I think Christian worded it best. It's, it wasn't a priority. And the moment there's a crisis, we saw what happened. Trump encouraged the fed to print trillions of dollars, right? Like we can't get, we can't get past that. Now you could look at it and say, well, there was a pandemic or was this. Okay. I understand extenuating circumstances, but at the same time that he was doing that, Thomas Massey was the one guy in Congress going, I'm going to make you come here and vote, and I'm voting no on all these massive government spending packages. So that's why I think I can say with confidence that the Liberty Wing would, would cut the deficit, the the you know progressive wing of the conservative party would increase it, and and the the right wing populist side um it would in good times. I think they potentially would in bad times. I, don't I think, think they would talk a good game, but actions speak louder than words. And yeah. I look at the Trump administration's record on that and it's not great. The, the, the last question on the economics thing, and I think it'll allow you to transition to talking about taxes. I've got one more. I've got to ask before right. you just asked a question. It's my <laughs> turn now. The, the last question that I've got is monetary policy and, oh. and feel free to, to, to expand that out to fiscal policy and related to taxes. Well, if no, you want fiscal to fiscal policy. We kind of already talked with deficit cause that's, that's fiscal policy really is, is, are you going to run deficits? Well, that's a, that's a fiscal <laughs> question. Monetary question is, are you going to engage in an in, in inflationary monetary policy? The Liberty wing? Absolutely not. They are, they are people like Ron Paul, Rand Paul, Thomas Massey, 
they believe that the free market works. I believe that as well. And so when there's a massive economic downturn or when there's a problem, their question is not, their, their first question is not, how do we, how do we throw money at this? Their first question is, how did we get here? And lo and behold, the Austrian theory of the business cycle seems to explain it pretty well, which is most cases where you have a massive economic dip, things like the housing bubble, right? Things like you had massive government inter uh, intervention on the front side of that. And then they use massive government intervention on the back end of it. So they're more likely to say, look, economic downturns happen. But if you want to make them, if, if you want to turn a, a recession into a depression, print a bunch of money, do a bunch of government spending, have a bunch of government regulations. And the reason why they know this is that there's there's this funny little story called, I think it was the uh, uh, the Great Depression of like 1921 or something like that. There was no Great Depression in 1921. There was a huge economic downturn. The difference was is that Woodrow Wilson had just had a stroke. His wife was pretty much running the presidency. They couldn't really do anything about it. And then when Harding and Coolidge came in, their attitude was the government should not intervene. And the next thing you know, there was a massive recovery. Right, twenty nine and 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 twenty nine and uh, the thirties, you had Hoover and FDR. Hoover and FDR believed in massive government intervention, and they turned they turned a recession into a depression as a result. So your Liberty Wing are going to look at that and say monetary policy is not the way to do it. They're the guys that would say audit the Fed, potentially get rid of the Fed. We need sound money. Your uh, your your Bush Romney guys. They could care less. They will, they will, they love the idea of printing money when it suits their purposes. And then when it comes to the right wing populace, again, I don't think they would necessarily, they're not going to necessarily go with whatever the banks want to do because they're skeptical of the banks, but put the right crisis situation in, in play. And they're going to look at it from the standpoint of, well, if we got to do this to maintain political power, well, we can't do anything if we're not out of office. So printer machine go burr. And I think we have proof that that would happen. All right, one final question on the economic side from yeah. our good friend Ben Stone, who doesn't live too far from us. How does the Liberty... This is a hard question. Try, right. try and get it under two minutes if you can. <laughs> okay. I know we got to move on. How does the Liberty Wing's negative view of protectionism address national security issues, such as the fact that China makes the vast majority of our antibiotics as well as tech and our weapons? So that's that's interesting. China does not make the, the vast majority of our tech and weapons. Okay. They, they don't. Now, with, with a lot of stuff on the medical, that's absolutely true. Here's the part where you have to ask the question of competitive advantage versus being able to maintain, you know, your particular industries within peacetime. Now, one of the ways that we maintain, like, because most of our weapon systems are, you know, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, you know, right. some of our small arms come from like FNFL, which is a, a Belgian company and whatnot. But a lot of, a lot of our weapon systems are, are domestically produced by major companies, right? Now, Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex. I think it was a good warning. Uh, a lot of the foreign aid that we give to countries is not foreign aid in the, in the sense that we just hand them money. A lot of it has to do with military aid and a lot of it has to do with military equipment. So we will give them, we will give them essentially money, which has to be spent on American military equipment. Now, you can believe whatever you want about this, but I will say that as far as giving another country money goes, what this does is it allows the American defense industry to continue to produce weapon systems for our military, but also be able to produce it for foreign militaries, which, oh, by the way, is kind of advantageous to us. If one, we've got to fight alongside allies or, or two, we know what they have, right? Yeah. So th this is the part where the, the Liberty Wing is going to you know run into some questions. Um, I, I would say that the, the best way to ensure... Um, solvency and, and resiliency within the American economy is not to automatically engage in tariffs or, or so grossly subsidize American industry that, okay, we can produce everything. Because once you do that, you can make an argument that, well, everything's a strategic resource. Um, actually, it's, it's maximizing competitive advantage within the economy while you have it with the understanding that it, as long as you're not fighting a bunch of aggressive wars, we, you, I mean, we have time to actually develop our own industries in the United States to produce the, the materials of war that you need. And what proved this was World War II. Okay. All right. When World War II, it's not like we had some massive defense industry that was doing all, but we had to ramp up very, very quickly. And we were able to ramp up very, very quickly. And what that meant is that we couldn't conduct a lot of offensive operations right away. Um, against the Japanese empire or against the Germans or whatnot. But what ended up happening? Well, Ford and GM shifted from manufacturing 
automobiles for the civilian population to much more manufacturing heavy in the military. Singer sewing machines was, was, you know, making rifles and things like that. So we have the industrial capacity to be able to shift very quickly within a free market to be able to produce the things that we absolutely need. The question is, is will, will there be, can there be pain in, in an interim period? There can be, but if, if the pain that you're enduring by not engaging in free market principles, by engaging in protectionism, um, is worse than what you're getting by facilitating that transition in the moment of crisis, I, I think you're not only not doing a good thing based off of cost-benefit analysis, but you're also creating problems because now you're creating industries which are dependent upon the government for their survival, and so they become the best lobbyists. And that's where you get things like your military industrial complex, right? So I, I think, I still think while the, you know, there's no perfect answer where it's like, yeah. oh, if we just do it this way, everything's beautiful. No, there's trade-offs. And, and the trade-off in a world where we embrace free markets, I think, produces the best long-term results all overall for the United States. You could argue that differently um, if you weren't sitting in between the two largest oceans in the world, right, safe from any sort of military power that has the capacity to, to actually affect us. Right. The United States has a major geographical advantage when it comes to that as well. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. There are other countries where they may need to have a little bit more protectionism when it comes to their defense industry. Israel, for instance. Um, but that's not the case in the United States. I mean, the, the, the Germans were not selling Mausers to France in 1913. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, all right. So next one, we're going to move into taxes. I'm sorry. We kind of, we, we, I'm taking a long time. I love this topic, but, um, and we want to make sure that we always get to your questions. We'll always prioritize your questions. All right, let's get to taxes. Um, I, this is one where the Liberty wing, I think significantly cuts taxes. Um, the right wing populist wing, I think significantly cuts taxes. The, the Bush Romney, you wing know what they do play in the margins. The Bush Romney wing make the tax code more complex. Mm -hmm. That's what they do. They do more carve outs. They do more, they do carve -outs. more tax credits, tax and credits, exemptions, tax exemptions. And yeah, that's what they do. And, and, and ultimately what ends up happening is they, they have some stuff that's more populist oriented. Um, but, but yeah, I think you nailed it, Christian. They, they make the tax code more complex, which always works in the favor of the people that are better at, hiring tax attorneys and the larger companies. Yeah. My, my, um, uh, um, uh, my, my accountant would, would love a return to the Bush Romney days. <laughs> um, <laughs> Cause it necessitates the requirement for more people like that. You know, I, I'm sure H and R block is, is just begging for lobbying you know, the government. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Somebody like Chris Christie to win the Republican nomination. So I, I actually do think on the taxes that there is a significant amount of overlap between the, the, the Trump populist wing of the party and, and the Liberty, you know, Ron Paul, Rand Paul wing of the party because Trump did cut taxes. No, he, he did. And he, and he cut them in a way that was significant. And he also cut them in a way that in some cases was more, was also a form of simplification. And then he also cut them in a way that didn't let high tax states get out of it. Oh, I loved how they got oh, rid yeah. of the salt exemption because in some ways that actually offset some of the, yes. the impact of the tax increase in a way that actually was fair because the left are hypocrites on this where they say, you know, soak the rich, but then they, they allow the rich to deduct their high tax states on their federal taxes. Yeah. All that that is doing is allowing the, the federal government to subsidize the high tax environments of states like California, Illinois, and New York. Yeah. My, my concern is, is that the, the right wing populist side will go for targeted tax cuts, which again, favor, favor institutions, organizations, or businesses, which they believe are, you know, ideologically aligned where, and, and so that's the same thing the left, you know, will, will potentially do. They, they don't usually do it in the form of tax cuts. Um, they usually do it in the form of direct government subsidies and payouts and transfer payments. Whereas the, the right wing populist side would be like, yeah, yeah we're going to cut taxes. Oh, except for, you know, the company over there that wants to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, that's a little bit harder to do under equal protection of the law, um, you know, and, and, you know, constitutional amendments and whatnot. So, but I, I do think that's, but I do think they would believe in tax or uh, cutting taxes and, um, and simplification of the tax code. Um, the the Romney wing, they would complicate the tax code. Um, and then with the Liberty wing, the Liberty wing, I think, would not only um, advocate for lowering taxes across the board, they would be heavily interested in massively changing the way taxes look in this country, like repeal of the 16th Amendment side. Um, I, I could see them going for 
either a, a fair tax or what they call a fair tax or a flat tax. Can, can you explain the 16th Amendment real quick? 16th Amendment is the one that gave the federal government the right to, to basically tax income, regardless of uh, proportionalities within states. And what's the difference between the flat tax and the fair tax? So the, the flat tax essentially says that we're going to have uh, like maybe one or, or three levels of taxation, which says that, okay, you're taxed at 7%, uh, you know, up to this income. So you're, you're taxed at, for instance, you're taxed up to 7% of your income at $50,000 or less. Then when you cross over anything above that $50,000 amount is taxed at uh, 12%. And then finally the last tax bracket might be anything that you make over $250,000 a year is taxed at like 18%. Right. But that's, that's, that would be the flat. So it would still be progressive in some sense. A straight flat tax just says everybody pays 15%. Like Love that's, that. Big that's your, that. that's your flat tax. Your fair tax, the only way, please hear me when I say this, the only way a fair tax works is if you either amend or um, get rid of the 16th Amendment to the Constitution. If you implement a fair tax while the 16th Amendment stays intact as it is currently written, you are going to end up with all the crap you currently have plus a national sales tax. Because that's the way to look at what a fair tax is. It's a consumption tax, right? It's a sales tax. Now, in, in European countries, they have a value-added tax, which is another form of kind of like it's a more complex sales tax, um, but it, it actually seeks to be more fair. We can argue whether or not that's true or not. What, what, a, what I think you would see the, the Liberty Wing go for is that they would say, okay, look, we're going to acknowledge that there's some justification for taxes, right? That would be a, that would be a compromise on their part. <laughs> and then they would go in and say like, all right, but what is, what is the most, uh, what is the fairest way to collect taxes, the easiest way to collect taxes, which requires the least amount of government intervention, audits, things of that nature. And they would probably go for something like a, a eliminate all the other taxes and just keep like your national sales tax. They might keep tariffs as a possibility in there, mainly for trade negotiation. Um, or they would go with a flat tax if they didn't think they could get the 16th amendment um, overturned or amended. So that's, that's what I think. I think the Liberty wing would be very, very interested in how do we not only reduce taxes across the board, but how do we eliminate the federal government's ability to raise the sort of taxes? And then on like the state level, uh, you would see the same thing. They, they would probably try to create baskets where it's like, okay, you have a, you have a, uh, local taxing authority, state taxing authority, and then your your federal taxing authority. But that's that's what I think would be would be the difference. So why is there such a stark difference between the Romney and Bush wing and the Liberty wing and how they handle taxes? Because again, I I think I don't want to call their I don't want to call the the Bush Romney wing Burkean in in the sense, but in some cases it kind of is. So Christian said it best. When, when you say a conservative party, what does that mean? Well, it, it's generally associated with kind of uh, valuing tradition and maintaining a certain status quo and maintaining a certain order of things. Now, American conservatism uh, has had those attributes at times, but it's also been focused. American conservatism is almost always associated with protecting the constitution, our federalist system and things like that. That's what Americans are trying to conserve. And that's why American conservatism sometimes can look very, very different from conservative parties in other countries where they're trying to conserve a monarchy, right? Like we yeah. have American conservatives have no interest in conserving things like that. It's generally rooted in, in constitutional principles. Oh, there's, there's one last point that I want to bring up to the audience because they might find this useful if they get into a debate with someone on the left on taxes. I remember in 2017 just being bombarded all over the internet and in real life from people being like, Trump's tax scam is going to blow a hole in the budget. It's going to cost, you know, $10 trillion over 10 years or whatever. Like all of these just absurd claims about how like Trump's cutting taxes for the wealthy and it's going to like impact the budget. The federal budget today, federal collections, not budget, how much money the federal government brings in, the IRS collects. Yeah. The IRS collected last year just a tad under $5 trillion in revenue. The year before the tax cuts were signed in 2017, and by the way, they were signed at the end of 2017, but the year before in 2016, the federal government collected about $3.25 trillion. Yeah. Now, there was a huge jump because of COVID. Yeah. And so now if you get in deeper and you're actually talking to somebody on the left that, you know, has like two brain cells put together, they're going to counter and say, oh, but Christian, that's not a fair comparison because COVID and all the money printing and everything inflation. So, so that's not a fair comparison. Okay, fair enough. So look at, at federal tax collections in, in um, 2019 or um, in 2020 before all the money printing went up. 
And even then, you see that federal tax collections were about 3.5 to 3.6 trillion. So federal tax collections actually went up yeah. between Trump's tax cuts being signed and right before COVID. And since then, it's skyrocketed. Well, and this has to do with like the Laffer curve. And, and Art, Art Laffer was an economic advisor for Ronald Reagan. I, I actually got to, to meet him and actually spend a couple days uh, with a group of about, there was only about 20 of us. So we actually got to sit there for two days and like ask Art Laffer questions about what about this? What about this? How, what is the best tax policy? How do you set it up? And, and it was interesting because he's famous for something called the Laffer curve, which is to say that as taxes go up, your your revenues will eventually drop. And the idea behind that is, is the more productivity, the more productivity you tax, the less productivity you get as opposed to that which you want to tax. So his argument is always taxes should not, taxes should have nothing to do in his mind. Taxes should have nothing to do with like encouraging this behavior or discouraging that behavior. Taxes are for one reason and one reason only, and that's to raise the necessary revenue to run the essential functions of government. And so you do that the simplest, the most straightforward way you possibly can, and then you stop. That's it. Don't use the tax code as a way to manipulate and try to achieve certain behaviors. You're just trying to raise revenue for the government to run only the essential services. And, and again, and, and he demonstrated, like, if you, you can actually raise government revenues by taxing less if it encourages greater economic productivity within your country, because then you have more to tax. All right. So that's kind of the differences there. And let's go to the differences on education. And this is one where I, I think that there are some significant differences. I think with things like Romney Bush, we already saw. We saw things like no child left behind as if more federal micromanagement of education was going to be the key to making education better. Um, now, ultimately, he said, well, yeah, if we have more testing and we do this, then we can intervene quicker. Like this was always the idea, right? The, the planners love to plan, man. And if the one plan doesn't work, it's only because they need a better, more precise plan with more power and more money. So... Ultimately, I don't think they challenge the system within our public education system. I don't think they challenge the Department of Education, or the federal government's role in education. They don't really challenge any of that. They might give lip service to it on the campaign trail, but ultimately, they just would spend the money a little bit differently. They would make the rules a little bit differently. But that's it. They, there, there would be no significant change between them and the left with respect to funding of education or monitoring of education. Um, the right-wing populist side... They definitely believe in, in use. They, I think they believe that first of all, they have no, they have no problem with charter schools. They're, they're fine with charter schools. They're fine with more choice in education. They're fine with homeschooling. They're fine with all of that. And, and they'd be even be fine with expanding it, but they are more likely to use a, an institution like the department of education to push what they believe would be positive curriculums and positive. Um, and, and, and look, you can go to the Trump website on this, right? The Trump website says, you know, he believes that the parents should get to elect the principals for their respective schools. Great that you believe that, but you're running for president of the United States and nowhere in the Constitution does it give the president of the United States the ability to, to influence that decision. So you have no legal authority to do it, which means the only way that you could do it is through fiscal, which means you have to have the Department of the $79 billion budget of the, of the Department of Education in order to influence those decisions. So I think the difference here is your right-wing populist is going to say, yep, we're fine with school choice. Yep, we're fine with this other stuff, but... As far as the mechanism that's currently under government control, we're going to use the power of government to push that in a direction that we think is beneficial for the nation, right? Your 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 Romney people, they don't really care. They just want to talk they just want to brag about how much money they spend on education. And then your Liberty Wing is 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 there to basically say we should not have a Department of Education. Um, Look at Massey's bill that he introduces every oh, Congress. So one great. line, one page bill. Yeah. The Department of Education will will terminate operations on insert yeah. date here. And it's amazing because <laughs> when you say that, people think, oh, you're anti-education. Massey would argue, no, I love education. I want a whole lot more of it. And right now, $79 billion is getting funneled through the Department of Education. I, I once did this. Yeah, the guy who got two degrees from MIT is anti-education. <laughs> yeah. Give me a break. Yeah. I, so I think the Liberty Wing is is drastically different view of, of education. There, there would be very, very little federal involvement. What's, I think if, if, um, if Massey was in charge with the federal, the, the federal government's, the one role that they might do is they might have a small little agency in two offices in, in a building somewhere just collecting data um, that the states would then give to them or maybe provide some of their own independent assessments, if that right? If that, and that's not because they're anti-education it's because they don't see it as a legitimate function of the federal government. And, and Oh, by the way, I did this as a thought exercise once with a bunch of people that were, were not Liberty people. They weren't even really Republicans. 
And I said, well, do you know that for the budget of the, for the budget, I can't remember what year I did this, but if you took the entire budget of the, the Department of Education, if you took it away and you gave every public school teacher in the country, right? This is not my plan, by the way. I just wanted yeah. to do as a thought exercise. You gave them a raise. You could give each of them a $20,000 a year raise year over year. Year over year. You could sustain a $20,000 a year raise, pay increase for teachers in the public school system with the current budget. If you look at the budget growth, you could give them year over year uh, pay increases on top of that initial $20,000 pay increase. I said, so I, I want to ask you a question. Based off of whatever the DOE is funding to include all of the overhead involved in funding their buildings and funding their staff positions Huge and funding building. their programs and then funding the oversight of the programs that they put into play, you know, do you think whatever they're doing is better than giving every single public school teacher a twenty thousand dollar a year pay increase? I would love to see how. <laughs> and what was their response? Their their response? Well, well, there there are a lot of important things that they're doing. Okay, go tell your teachers that. <laughs> go tell your teachers. Go tell your teachers that you're sitting on top of a twenty thousand dollar a year pay raise for them that you don't want to give them because you think whatever the DOE is doing is so important as as to make sure that the money stays with bureaucrats in Washington D.C. See, that's a very, very different dynamic. Now, again, not my policy, not what I would advocate doing with that money. However, it's important to note that even the people that are saying this is for the teachers. Okay, great. You could give them all this. But that's not No, that's here's the, the thing. With. They want to give the teachers a pay raise without cutting anything from federal spending for yeah. education because as, as, as I, I, I will always harp on until I die, fiscal... Fiscally conservative politicians, frugal politicians have a very short lifetime mm -hmm. in politics. Like you do not get elected, you certainly don't 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 get promoted if you campaign as a fiscal conservative. You can get elected and you can you can become president of the United States if yeah. you just promise enough people enough money. And so those same people, their solution one day will be, you know, Nick's totally right and that's why we need to raise taxes to give <laughs> teachers a $20,000 raise. Well, I, I think the other thing too with the liberty side is that they would be, so again, we're not just talking about the federal, we're talking about state. What would it look at the state level as well? What would it look like if this was a predominant theory within culture or idea, ideology within culture? There, there would be a huge emphasis on alternatives to uh, public, publicly administered education. In fact, the, the battle that you would see within the Liberty side is some people that would say, okay, we should have things like ESAs and dollars should follow students. So the government would essentially assist in the subsidization of education, but it wouldn't administer the education except in some very, very limited roles. The other side would say, no, I don't even want that. What we want is tax credits for education, which is to say that if you're educating your, you know, you're educating your child, we, we acknowledge that you're educating your child. We acknowledge that there's a societal benefit to educating your child. And so you, you get a credit uh, against your taxes for doing it. Um, one last question that I've got on the education topic before we move on is what would you say is the difference between all three of these branches of, of the conservative movement or Republican Party, whatever you want to call it? Yeah, probably conservative movement is a better phrase. What would you say is the difference between these? on the issue of what they're teaching and how they're teaching, like certain cur curriculum. I know that it, like Florida, for example, has made a lot of headlines over the past few years with the stuff that they're doing within their school system and their university system. Yeah. So like in terms of like, you know, what conservatives would call like, you know, left-wing indoctrination or wokeism yeah. or CRT or all these different things that are being pushed within the public and higher school system, how, how would you break down the difference between these three different groups on that topic? So the, the, the Bush Romney side just doesn't really care that much. Um, as far as that indoctrination, they know it's there, but they also, they, they go to all the same cocktail parties, all their big, you know, their donors donate millions of dollars to their alma maters and whatnot. And they just look at this as kind of a, a club. Um, again, I know I'm being rough on them. Tough. Sorry. I, I don't, I don't have nice feelings. Toward them. <laughs> the other one is the, the Trump wing would, I think, or not the Trump wing, but the right wing populist wing, I think would be more apt to say, we don't need the 1619 project in schools. We need the 1776 project in schools because that's beneficial to building a, a country. And, and again, you, you can argue for that. The Liberty wing would say, no, we don't need politicians deciding this. We, we need parents to be empowered, to be able to make their own decisions. And, to make, and some parents are going to choose 1619. And some parents are going to choose 1776, but each individual parent being able to make those decisions is vastly better than us having to battle every four years on, on which curriculum the federal government is going to attempt to shove down our throats based off of which party happens to currently be in the ascendancy. 
And so that that's the big difference. I think one would use government to try to push what they believe. And, and, and again, they would push an ideology um, that I would be more inclined to agree is positive. You know, that, that has net positive benefits is more in tune with reality, more in tune with critical thinking, more in tune with logic, but they would still force it. Right. The other side would, would maintain the status quo. The left would try do that in the opposite. And then the Liberty wing says, guys, the, the way that you take the politics out of education is by taking the politics out of education. This is why I also, I, I, I have a real hard time with people running for like school board where it is clear that they have a very hardcore ideological bent and they want it in the public schools, but then they run as an independent and they run on, I'm going to get the politics out of, no, you're not. If the government is still the ones responsible for funding it, subsidizing it, administering it, deciding what the curriculum is, then I got news for you. Politics is in your school. If you want, if you genuinely want the politics out of your school, you have to get the government out of the business of administering education. What's so your response? What's your response to, um, you know, people on the more populist side who say, you know, Nick, that, that sounds in theory good, but we should not permit the teaching of self-destructive ideologies that will end up destroying kids' lives the, and also making them hate their country or hate their neighbor. The or, question always becomes who gets to decide what the self-destructive ideologies are. But here's are. the difference. Here's the difference. And I, I'm, I'm pushing back a little bit because yeah. I actually, I, I, for the longest time had a very libertarian position on this issue. Yeah. And I now fall more in like the 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 quote from from Phocion, the famous Greek orator who said, you know, I will not permit my citizens to destroy themselves even if they wish it. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. and the, the the response is, look, if, if you're going to argue, you know, oh, if you want to teach 1619, go ahead and teach that, but don't force other people to do it. And likewise, if you want to teach 17, 1776, you should be yeah. able to go ahead and do that. That sounds great and all, but unless you actually eliminate government education, as long as you have government education of any sort, and I'm not saying you expand yeah. private schooling. If you have any government education, you have a responsibility to ban the teaching of self-destructive methods and ideologies that will foster hatred within this country between people based on race or no, gender. I, so listen, let me let me clarify something. Yes, the, the, the thing we're arguing about is if the liberty people were in charge, what would education look like? And what I was saying is if the liberty people were in charge, the government would not be administering education. They would not be running it. Now, so you, they, you they think might, they, they would completely eliminate government? We're talking about what the, what their ideal is, and their ideal okay. would be that the government might still be involved with respect to subsidies. Like, so for instance, when, when the government wanted to feed hungry people, didn't open up 10,000 government grocery stores, hire tens of thousands of employees, and then determine what grocery stores would carry. It said, here's a voucher for food, and oh, by the way, there's the free market. Go buy the stuff you want. Now, to some extent, it limited things, right? It's like, okay, here's your, here's your EBT card. You can't go buy booze with it, right? You can't go buy booze. But so that's where the part where you could have some area where if it was like, okay, I, I think what they would say is government's no longer to be involved in, in administering and running your schools because it doesn't do a good job. Now, some people prefer, you know, or some people view the world differently than other people. That's fine. Now, are there ways that you could limit that where you could say, look, if you want, um, like if you want dollars to follow students, the government still has a fiduciary duty to, to ensure that you're not sending your school or you're not sending your kid to a school, which is then teaching them to hurt other people based off of their skin color. And so you could, you could set in restrictions, which say like, Hey, here's the, here's the bare minimum. You, you can't, you can't send to your school. That's essentially, um, you know, teaching them to hate other people, teaching them to hurt other people, teaching them to take other people's things and steal. You, you can't, if it's illegal, you can't send your kid to a school that is teaching them to do illegal things. That would be kind of like the baseline that you could establish um, that would you know, potentially I just have a hard time believing that like I, I – you and I both love history, Nick. And, yeah. and we both know that there there is no record in history, in the history of civilization at least, of a civilization surviving, raising its own children to hate its own civilization. Okay, but wait a like, second. Wait a imagine second. if the Roman Empire raised children to hate Rome. Okay, but imagine. Okay, but uh, uh, now look at. Let's put another thing. Imagine somebody raising their children during the the reign of Nero to hate what Nero was doing to the Christians in the Colosseum and his garden. 
No, no. There's a difference between hating a particular action yeah. and hating Roman civilization itself. No, I, I I get that, but my problem is is that you are always going to run into you're always going to run into this constant nitpicking battle of where are yes, the yes you will and 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 that, that's the point that that the populace will say the populace will say you the libertarian ideal is literally unworkable. You will never get a scenario. The side that wants to win will always beat the side that wants to be left alone, okay. and the libertarian side wants to be left alone, and therefore that is why they always perpetually lose to the left. Because okay, but again, you're, you're once again, you're not stay true to what we're talking about right now. And what we're talking about right now is the the whole premise of this discussion is if culturally and politically this wing of the party had the ability to do what they wanted, what would that look like? This is what it would look like. And now what they would also say is that the let's face it, part of the reason why the left wins on the education argument is because they have this massive political entity not only subsidizing and controlling education, but then controlling the environment for which you are going to work and operate. You mean now, the teachers' unions, right? I don't just mean teachers' unions. I mean just business in general. If all of a sudden you had a world, right? It, and again, I, we know this is pie in the sky. But if all of a sudden you had a world where, yeah, you can be, you can educate, you can believe what you want, but guess what? Guess who has the final say? Reality. Reality has the final say. And if you can't get a job, we're not bailing you out. And if you can't do and if you can't do these things, not not because of the color of your skin, not because of your sex, if you can't do these things because you decided you were going to teach your child or you decided you were going to go to a university that taught you that you were entitled to everything and you had a right to everything, but now you no longer have the political apparatus necessary in order to, to steal those things from other people. Guess what? Reality is going to teach you a really hard lesson really quick. And you're going to start to learn that ideas that might have sounded really good in that university they were teaching you don't actually work out in real life. And so over time, what ends up happening is people abandon the educational opportunities that don't set them up for success in the real world when they can actually do it. But in the current system, no, no, no. If you can't afford an alternative, and by the way, we're taxing you for this one. If we can, if you can't afford an alternative to the one that we're taxing you to subsidize, right? It's not just that. Well, oh shucks, no. We we arrest you under truancy charges. <laughs> I'm loving this debate, by the way. Yeah. If, if we got if we some ever, more questions from the if audience. we ever um uh, do, I know in the future we're going to do more episodes on education because it's an important topic. But no, that the, the 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 back and forth between that that libertarian ideal and the and the more populist or conservative ideal, I feel like both sides have legitimate points. Yes, and, and you and I, I, I think agree more than we disagree on this topic, but I know that there are some some prominent disagreements there. So I actually really liked the back and forth there because I, yeah. I felt like that was really constructive. What's the what's the question, All right. Hamilton? We have a crush question from Chris Fegley. Would using the funds that the DOE would have gotten and redirecting it towards a $10,000 raise for teachers and the rest towards modernizing the buildings and educational materials, would that be a better solution? No, I don't think so. I, I So again, w would that be better than the way the DOE is currently spending money? Yes. Um, is it potentially a more politically palatable way to get the deal? Probably, right, than, than what we might consider to be the actual ideal. Um, having said that, all you all you would end up doing through that is reinforcing once again the the federal government's ability to come in and determine pay for teachers. And then when it comes to modernization of buildings, right, most of your school construction is not done by the federal government, right? It's done by localities in conjunction with state budgets. So if if you're giving the federal government more control to do that, um, that would be problematic. Let's say you just did it as a grant. The government came down and said, "Hey, here's a grant of money. Um, we're not funding the DOE anymore, but each year we're going to give you a grant for." Half of the grant goes to teacher raises, right? Because the federal government can put those kinds of restrictions on, on federal dollars. And then the other half goes to, to school modernization. One of, the, one of the big issues that I have right now with the way that we look at public education is so much of it ends up being employment and infrastructure projects, right? It's this whole idea that what we need for better education is, is more school building modernization, Okay, I, I can I can see that argument to a point, but the thing that I always want to ask back is, okay, so show me the benefit. Yeah. Show me how your school, you know, building mod you know, uh, modernization actually achieved better economic or better uh, academic outcomes. If you can't do those two things, 
then don't tell me about all the awards you're building one. Right. And, and I've seen this before. Where it's like, oh, we, you know, <laughs> we won all these educational awards. What for? Having the buildings with the best green energy technology. Like, oh, well, thank God. I'm sure that's great for our kids, right? They, they wanted to go there to learn math. But uh, they, you know, they, hey. they may not have wanted to, <laughs> yeah, but all right. Oh, I've, I've uh, got I've got an example of this. Yeah. Eastern View High School, where I went to high school. Yeah. Anybody who lives in Culpeper or has been to this high school knows that, that it's it's right off a highway and it's in the middle of nowhere, like like literally right off a highway. And that's the only way that you have to that you can get to it is you get on a highway. There's bicycle racks <laughs> at Eastern View High School. <laughs> And they put them there because they needed to because of federal and state funding requirements. <laughs> oh, my goodness. On a highway. You can Nobody be, bikes to, to you, school there. You could, it's not you, like in the middle of a city or something like that. You could theoretically, I, I guess, come from the eastern side. But <laughs> okay. We have a comment that I would like to bring up from Cataphrax, who is an OG subscriber. Yeah. He says, I'm with Christian. There has to be some level of determination of right and wrong if you're going to teach children. Libertarian ideology breaks down a bit when it comes to raising kids. What are your thoughts on that? Is that, that a Nick? question or just it's a, a comment? A I, just, I just wanted oh. your thoughts on it. I, I again, my question will always go back to who gets to decide, and and if and if the process is as well, we get to decide through democratic processes and and the government. My question is going to be, how's that working out for you? Right. Because th this never happens in a vacuum, right? This never happens in a vacuum where it's just. Oh, okay. We're going to set up a system, and it turns out, you know, who, the people we believe are the good guys are going to decide what what is what is good and what's good for the country, and uh, and the bad guys don't. Well, that's not how this works. And so, the, the apparatus that we have right now means that the people are going into your school and teaching your ten year old uh, about how to how do I put this without getting censored on YouTube? H how to engage in intimate activity with themselves, right? And you don't get to tell me that that isn't going on. It is. Now we can come back and say, yeah, but it wouldn't go on if we were in charge. Okay. We may not be in charge in 10 years. I, and, and not only that, but. We've never been in charge. Not, not, only, not only that, but in Idaho, in Idaho, they passed all the rules on this. Passed all the rules on this. And somebody went in with undercover cameras. And what did they find school administrators and principals doing? The same dang thing under a different name. Okay. So this is the part where, I, I'm sorry, I, I get it. It might be ideal. It might be what you want. But. As long as the Leviathan we always eventually disagree. swims left. We, we, then we definitely disagree on there. It's okay. I got another. Right, uh, but that's a topic question. for a future discussion yeah, for yeah. sure. One last question. And Nick, I'd, I think it'd be interesting if you answered this from the three different folks that we've been talking about. Okay. This one, this one is from Robin. Question. Would you support requiring educators to take a mental health exam to get certified? Oh, gosh. See, the, my issue. Okay. So from the three right-wing populists would say yes. Um, the, the, um, Liberty group would probably say no, probably say no. Well, I'll put it this way with the Liberty group, it wouldn't, it probably wouldn't be necessary. Well, <laughs> and they, then would, they be, all, <laughs> would they, would they leave the, de the decision up to the government? They no, would they would leave the, the decision up to the parents, the localities, the, the parents would say, so the, the right wing populist said is like, absolutely. You have to take a mental health exam. If you're going to teach kids, the, the Romney Bush wing would say no, because I don't know. They don't like it or it would make them feel weird at their cocktail parties. The The Liberty wing would say, why would you do that? We don't employ the teachers anymore. Right. Right. That's the, the Liberty wing would say the government doesn't employ the teachers. If the parents think that they're sending their kids to a school where the, the teachers are mentally unstable, well, then the solution is the parents now have the ability to remove their kids from that school and put them to another one. And the dollars will follow the kid to where they go. So, what they would say is this will naturally work itself out. Elizabeth Perry writes, no mental health exam because who decides what is normal? <laughs> and, and, and Elizabeth, right, right. Elizabeth Perry has a, I mean, again, the same people that would be administering this currently believe that a biological man, poof, becomes a woman the moment they have a deep psychological conviction that that's reality. And if you don't agree they're not the ones with the mental disorder. You have a bigotry problem. Yep. I don't want to put those people in charge of deciding who teaches my kids. That's what this comes down to. Just a quick reminder for everyone. If you have a question as we go forward, please put question in the beginning of your comment, and that would, will help me find it and go back and get it for you. And uh, let's keep going. All right, next we're going to go on to the military. And this is one where I actually, this is, I mean. You might be speaking with some experience I, on this, right? I think everybody knows what a hardcore, like I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm team Liberty on, on so much what? of this stuff. I thought you were about to be like, yeah, we need to be bombing more countries and invading more I'm, countries. I'm Support team, the troops. I'm team Liberty on so much, but on this one, there's, there's, 
I, I have a lot more nuance on this position. So the right wing populist yeah. side under Trump, this was one of my favorite things about Trump. I actually agree. This is one of my favorite things about his Trump. His foreign policy was actually, you know, what's funny is when he was running for president, there were people yeah. that were like, he's going to get us into like nuclear war or he's going to like alienate our allies or whatever. <laughs> like, like, I mean, in some ways he did alienate our allies. And I think in a good way, because he actually put pressure on NATO to start just you know, the fulfilling their ones. obligations. But like <laughs> Trump's foreign policy was probably in some ways, like the most successful part of his presidency considered the fact that, that, he he actually took you know the fire to China on so many different things that like he was the if, if I recall he was the first administration to call out China for committing genocide within yeah. China he was the first administration to actually start stringing together some of these Southeast Asian countries into a coalition against Chinese expansion he was the first administration to go to our NATO allies and basically tell them stop freeloading off of the United States yeah. and start upholding your end of the bargain and increase your defense spending to the necessary two percent of GDP that's required under NATO and when he was president, Russia didn't invade Ukraine. We actually had peace in Europe, which was the exception to the rule when you look at the Obama administration that came before and the Biden administration that came after. Oh, and by the way, he was pulling us out of Middle Eastern wars without making us look like, hum without humiliating us in the process yeah. like we did under Joe Biden. I, I think, yeah. So There's a was, lot to actually well, like about funny. Trump's Ka foreign Ka policy. Cataphrax said, he goes, I really didn't like Trump's foreign policy. He didn't have one. He had some really good people in his cabinet. Trump applauded and cheered uh, Xi Jinping and Kim Jong Un. So here's here's let's go ahead and do the let's do into the appropriate ca uh, caveats right here. I don't agree with everything Trump did within his foreign policy. However, comparatively, like in my lifetime, one of the best, and it isn't even close. And and it's for all the reasons that Christian mentioned. Um, he, he, he kind of personified this idea of, uh, well, I wouldn't say walk softly, but, but when it, when it came to invading, I mean, think about this for a second, every other president in my lifetime going back to Reagan, right. And I was actually born. I actually was born during the Carter administration. Jeez. Every single one of them. Where to date yourself. Every single one of them was, <laughs> was more prone to military intervention than Donald Trump. Absolutely. Every single one. Every single one. Now, you you could argue that Biden hasn't got us in, involved in a ground war yet, all right? But he screwed up Afghanistan so bad that I I just I, I, I I'm so mad at him. Joe that. Biden has has had to spend a hundred a hundred billion dollars supporting Ukraine in an actual shooting land war yeah. that's going on right now. And, as and we part speak. of that, and again, this is the part where the same people think like, oh well, you know, Putin, um, <laughs> you know, Putin wouldn't do this during Trump because Putin Trump was going to let him get whatever he wanted. No, he didn't. Putin, Putin invaded more countries over over Obama, under Obama and under um, Biden. He, he was surprisingly non-aggressive. He might have saber rattled, but you, guess where his saber stayed? In the scabbard. <laughs> when Trump was in office, the saber stayed in the scabbard in part because everybody knew Trump was willing to use military force. Everyone knew that if Trump was going to authorize military force, it wasn't going to be for nation building and it wasn't going to be to achieve. High, it was going to be to destroy you. That's what it was. Trump took this position that the U.S. military should be the best funded, trained, equipped, supported military in the world. And if he was going to use it, oh, baby, it I was I remember coming. when he was running in 2016 and he was like, my foreign policy when it comes to things like ISIS is bomb them to hell. And and like everybody yeah. cheered and, and and all the news anchors and pundits of the Washington oh, oh Post, New York Times, like how this is how, you know, he's he's <laughs> lacking all the, yeah, whatever. The, 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 like, like all of the opining about Trump's language yeah. on foreign policy with these ivory tower liberals at yeah. like the Washington Post and New York Times, it, like you look back and you say Trump's the record. Yes, did he say things that were uncomfortable when he was like yeah. praising <laughs> Xi Jinping and Kim oh yeah, Jong -un. absolutely. But also keep in mind, he also recognized a lot of these regimes work on egos. They do, and if you say nice things about them, yeah, they're more likely to sit down and listen to you. You lose, you lose nothing by saying something nice about an adversary that you have to negotiate with no matter what. That's yeah. real politique at the end of the day. Yeah. That, that was one of the biggest things is that when it came to actual policy, he was harder on these, on, on many of these regimes than anybody else. But when it came to kind of like public pronouncements and stuff like that, there were things that he said where it was like, whoa, 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 why are we meeting with Kim Jong-un and, and Trump's Trump's whole negotiation is art of the deal. The whole idea was he didn't mind giving away things that he thought on the larger scale, um, were, were insignificant. 
especially with, like you said, a very egocentric dictatorial regime, if it meant that he was actually getting practical things on the ground that he wanted that actually put America in a better position. So let's talk about the differences between the three different approaches. You want to start with the American first foreign policy yeah, so, of the populist wing. So with, wing. with the, the populist wing, I think you see an incredibly powerful military. I think you see a, a very well-supported military, funded military, trained military. Um, but surprisingly enough, a, a much more non-interventionist foreign policy. I think you see, and I'm basing this off of what Trump did, right? Trump went, like you said, Trump went to NATO and said, we're not we're not carrying the weight for you guys. You guys have these massive welfare states and everything else that you do, not just because of ideological grounds, not just you have it because you know the United States will bail you out of whatever you're going to whatever problems you're going to get yourself into. Mm -hmm. And he created the very real friction within that environment to suggest, holy crap, we might actually have to keep up our own end of the bargain here. Now, we can have larger nuanced arguments on whether or not it's a good idea. It is a bad idea. Is it good for Europe to, you know, be dependent on the United States because quite frankly, it keeps them from fighting among themselves, which quite frankly, pretty much all of European history has been Europeans killing Europeans. Mm -hmm. um, Europeans killing non-Europeans is actually a relatively new thing in Europe. <laughs> um, so the, that, that you can make that argument. However, um, it his you you can be uncomfortable with his bravado and I and I do think you would see much more of kind of that like Teddy Roosevelt. Feel. I was definitely uncomfortable with him saying nice things about Xi Jinping. Oh yeah, absolutely. B but absolutely. I, I I I do think actions speak louder than words, yeah. and I I probably the thing that I liked the most about the Trump administration was the American First Foreign Policy because it speaks to me in in what I believe through my own political worldview, and I, I I'm sorry, but I think outside of our borders, yeah. The number one important key focus of American foreign policy should be doing whatever needs needs to be done to put to put the best interest of the United States first for the people who live within it. Mm -hmm. That should be number one above everything else. Dead last, not dead last, but way below that should be what I think is the guiding principle of the Bush Romney foreign policy, which is making the world safe for democracy yeah. and nation building and yeah. promoting American values overseas. I'm all about promoting American values overseas because I think that our values work, but I don't think that nobody likes armed missionaries. No. And, <laughs> That's a and great I, I, I do think that, that, that like pushing American values at the point of a gun in civilizations, in countries and cultures that have no tradition of democratic rule, have no tradition of Republican systems of government, yeah. have no tradition of free markets. Well, the, and like, like as much as I support free markets, I don't think that imposing free markets by force in a place like Afghanistan is necessarily going to produce a positive outcome. Would Afghanistan benefit from free markets? Absolutely. Every place on earth would benefit from free markets, but it is not the role of the United States to go around the world and go find every tin pot dictatorship and impose a Republican free market system of government on them at the cost of American lives and American dollars. Well, I just don't think is, it is. This is the part where there's some elements of this. So I think the, the that's the right wing populist position. I think the, the Bush Romney position is... It, again, they, they're big. I think you said it best, right? They believe in the whole making the world safe for democracy. The best way we're going to do that is by parking an armored division in your backyard, which I don't think has proved to be the best way to do it. But I, I think that they do. I think they do that for strategic economic reasons, which by the way, it, no, going to war is not good for the economy any more than robbing a bank is is good for the economy. It may be good for certain people, right? But it's not good for the economy as a whole. Uh, but I do believe that for 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 certain select economic reasons, and it's this whole kind of savior complex of well, of course we have the ability to do something, and so we have the obligation to do something. I think they believe that is kind of like a, a moral mission. Um, the the Liberty Wing. I think the Liberty Wing would see a, a drastic pullback from most of the world with with uh, U.S. forces overseas. I do think you'd see a, a cut in the overall defense budget. It would still remain strong, but it would it would be significant cuts, and you would see significant differences with respect to foreign aid. Um, I think you'd see a lot of foreign aid pulled. Now, here's the part where, again, usually I'm I'm Team Liberty on this one, or usually I'm Team Liberty. The the the, the, here's the one area where I would disagree with the right wing, what I think the right wing populist view would be. I think they would leave the status quo in place. So they would, they would be more non-interventionist, but they would leave the status quo in place for actually engaging in military operations. I think they like the idea of their president being able to make those strategic decisions when necessary and Congress just approves the budget. The Liberty Wing 
would absolutely demand Congress vote if you're sending troops into hard into harm's way. And I'm I'm totally in favor of that. That's the one area where the other area that I'm in favor on the, on the uh, Liberty Wing is that I do believe we need a massive audit of the Department of Defense. I think we need to push back on what Eisenhower referred to as the military industrial complex. I think there's a ton of decisions right now that get that, that get made on defense spending that have nothing to do with defense and have everything to do with the lobbying of the, the military industrial complex and the presence of certain industries within certain congressional districts. That's what I think motivates that. And I think that's hugely problematic. I totally agree with the Liberty Wing. The areas where I disagree with the Liberty Wing on, this whole idea of like, let's just pull all of our troops home. They shouldn't be over there anyways. You are going to find yourself in a situation where I, I don't care you know, I don't care where you put the United States, you're going to find yourself in a situation where there's going to be wars that we can either prevent or end up fighting two years once they're into it. And, and you may, you may be able to fool yourself into believing that what goes on over there is just like, just totally not our problem. It will eventually become our problem. Um, now again, that's not true of everything, right? That's not true of every single conflict. I don't believe in boots on the ground in Ukraine, right? I don't, I don't believe in that. Um, by the same token, there is something to be said for a strong military presence by the United States, which does prevent typical, um, typical kind of cycles of violence within these various areas. Mm -hmm. So, so is it, is, is it a good thing to keep troops in, in South Korea? I would argue that it probably is. Is it a good thing to keep troops, certain troops in, in Europe? I would argue that it probably is. Now, are there other areas that we could potentially pull back from? And again, some of these maps where it's like, we have soldiers in 192 countries. Having a team of 12 Green Berets in Bangladesh teaching their border guard how to conduct operations is not quite the same thing as a massive military base in Germany. All right, so let, let's be intellectually honest and appreciate some of the nuance here, right? Having a military contingent and an embassy is not the same as <laughs> troops everywhere. So let's let's just be yeah. honest about what we're doing and, and where we're doing it. The other thing comes with foreign aid. Like I said, the, the largest recipient of U.S. foreign aid is Israel. The second largest is Egypt. At least it was recently. I don't know if that's it's it's, probably it's Ukraine, probably Ukraine now. now. Ukraine <laughs> now, but it was you know under under normal times, it's usually Israel and Egypt. Um, U.S. military foreign aid a lot of times comes in the in the way of us uh, allowing for certain military weapon systems and things like that to be sold to countries that are or at least somewhat allied with the United States. And some of the, the military dollars they get also are training. So we actually get to go in and train elements of their military. This is the part where you have to look at it from the standpoint of, look, if you just believe in the non-aggression principle and none of this should exist, well, then all of it goes away. If, if, however, and this is the more nuanced position I take, I look at human history and I see a never-ending stream of wars and I see the wars getting bigger and more brutal over time. Um, now, obviously, we've been involved in some, some pretty bad wars, but comparatively speaking, and I say this as someone that did you know deployed to Iraq, Right with first special forces group, I was a combat guy. Right, it's not like I was over there, you know, not not driving actually, trucks, not actually. Well, no, even driving trucks. The guys were putting themselves in danger. I'm just saying that I wasn't sitting in an air conditioned office somewhere facilitating paperwork. Right, my job was to close with and kill the enemy, along with training the Iraqi. Um, you scouts weren't a, and you, stuff like you that. weren't a pencil pusher in the green zone. No. <laughs> um, so, I, my, but my point is, is that w what I see is this natural tendency over time, and and despite what I believe to be, or have been major failures in U.S. foreign policy, I do believe that there's something to be said for the overwhelming American military dominance that has prevented countries that historically would have been invading each other by now from doing so because they were afraid of the U.S. military response. And there is a lot to be said for spending money in order to prevent wars. And so I, I think we need to be thinking about this, again, a little bit more nuanced than the very simple, not our business, not our problem, bring so them all home. Speaking of nuance, I want to get your take on things like international alliances such as NATO. Like, do you think that there's a difference between these three different you know branches of the right and their approach to something like NATO? I, I think right, right wing, the right wing populist side would say, well, stay in NATO as long as you're living up to your end of the bargain. Uh, the Bush Romney would stay in it because it's another. I think that they want to keep expanding NATO, like yeah. bring bring Ukraine, bring Georgia into NATO. Yeah, it's it for for the the Romney Bush wing. I think it's it, it for them. International organizations are a positive good in and of themselves. Like I, I don't even think they do a lot of 
heavy lifting. They, they will always make an argument, well, it's better to sit around the table and talk about these things. Really? Is it really better to be in the United Nations right now? The United Nations puts some of the worst human rights abusers as countries on the human rights committee. Like, uh, no, I'm sorry. All I believe that the UN is one of these organizations at this point that is propping up dictatorships and giving them legitimacy on a world stage. And, and I don't, and I don't see why we're, why we're paying them to do it. Um, the other thing, and so I think that's where the Bush Romney thing is, is like international organizations are almost always a net benefit because they believe. And in the that. Liberty Wing would actually like straight up pull us out of NATO, probably. I think the Liberty Wing would be, I don't know. And certainly out of the UN. Uh, I think they would pull us out of a lot of international organizations and treaties. Um, they, they would be more, they would be more isolationist when it came to politics and um, military. They would be far more expansive when it came to like trade and, and cultural mm-hmm. engagement. They'd be all about economic engagement they'd all be it'd be a lot more about the washington beware of entangling alliances um you know friend to everybody you know um that would be more the liberty position again the part that i struggle with is is because i have such a love of of history and a lot of that has resulted around military history i i have seen what happens when you don't have the sort of overwhelming military force that can provide a, a certain degree of regional stability. And, and again, I wish there was a better answer for that. And I'm, and I'm open to better answers for it. But as I look at it right now, from a practical standpoint, I do believe U S military dominance is a, is a positive thing. Um, ultimately for the United States military doesn't mean that there isn't massive reform that's, that's due. And, and I would still say I'm, I'm over on the team Liberty side on the mass on, on the majority of these issues. Uh, but I also see some real benefits from the right wing populist side as well. All right, time for another question. All right. This one is coming from Robin again. we got three more categories to go through. Three more categories. If China develops political relations in the Middle East, what will that look like in the parties you are discussing? They already have. I think she's asking about what would those three our three, three parties' uh, reaction to that be? I mean, so I, I, don't, I don't know that they would be, um, you know, the Romney-Bush... Um, coalition would look at it as an excuse for more intervention into the Middle East. Uh, the right wing populist side would, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what they, I honestly don't know what their response to that would be. I mean, China already has, they might retaliate. They Ch- might try to tell Middle Eastern countries, you get to choose either us or the Chinese. Yeah, they probably if you choose they, the Chinese. You will suffer for it. Yeah. The, the right, the right wing would probably, the, so Bush and Romney would respond with giving Middle Eastern countries more money. Um, right wing populism would, um, would respond with probably saying, okay, tariffs are on the way and we're going to pull the money we're already giving you. So the Bush Romney would be all carrot right wing populism would be more stick. And, and, and the, the libertarian side wouldn't care. Libertarian <laughs> like the, the Liberty side would be like, we don't care because we can get our oil from somewhere else. And Oh, by the way, we, we, you know, um, if that's the way you want to go, go for it. But they would have already pulled all the foreign aid anyways. So I, I think that that's how, I think that's how the three, the three groups would, would, um, respond to that. Um, you know, myself, I, I would line up a little bit in, I would line up somewhere probably in between the, the Liberty wing and the, the right wing populist wing on that, because it, I, again, I, I do think there's something to be said for the United States playing a, a, an important role in the world. Um, I think it should be a lot less militarily focused. Um, but by the same token, I, I, I think there's ways that we can, we can throw our weight around in a positive way. Here's an interesting question. What would each group's response or relationship to Israel look like? Uh, right wing populists would absolutely uh, support Israel, like to the hilt. They, uh, they and the Bush Romney wing are in agreement on that one. Yeah, they, they it's large, the libertarians they large, uh, that are the outlier there because their response would be, "Yeah, we need to cut foreign aid to Israel well, and every other country." The, the Bush Romney wing would 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 maintain a status quo where they're kind of throwing money at both sides to play nice. Trump would be more on the side of Trump would be more pro Israel. Um, and then the, the Liberty wing would be more hands off with all of it. Now, I, I do think that there, there are elements within the Liberty wing that, that do, um, value the relationship with Israel. Um, but I, I, I think that's what it, the, the, the Liberty side would be more hands off. The, um, Romney Bush side would again, throw money at both sides. And then the, uh, the Trump side would be more, would be more pro Israel. The, the right wing populist, I think would be more pro Israel. That's all right. That's all my right. prediction. All right. Next policy. All right. Immigration policy. 
right wing populist <laughs> build the wall baby <laughs> the wall. Hold on, hold on. what topic are we on immigration okay immigration so right wing pop build this the is wall. where you get some radical differences where mm-hmm. i would argue the libertarians and romney bushites are this is one of the few areas where the the establishment wing of the party and the liberty wing of the party are largely in agreement and it's the trump wing of the party that's the one that's that's sticking out like a sore thumb this is the one area where i think they all get it wrong Really? Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I want to hear this. So, so, <laughs> so the, 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 the Trump side is, is not only build the wall, but I, I think it's also, I, I think that within right wing, I, I shouldn't say Trump because Trump, I think is actually, uh, there, there's a lot of things I think he gets right on this, but right wing populism as an overall ideology, I mean, this isn't Trumpism. This is right. This is right wing populism. I think right wing populism is, is far more likely to not only want to secure the border, but actually cut off significant amounts of, of immigration across the board. I think the Romney Bush side uh, want to talk a good game on the border. There's probably some things they would do to try to, you know, uh, stem violence or maybe the drug war because they love their drug war. They, they would probably try to do that on the border. But other than that, they, they would be all about like selective immigration based off of what big business wanted, um, what the chamber wanted. And then uh, the libertarian side would probably be it, it would de- it depend Much more open borders uh, on the, on the libertarian side. There's kind of two trains of thought here. Like the, the Cato side of, of the Liberty wing would be open borders, free movement of people. What's the problem? Um, the other side of the Liberty wing would be like, well, no, we're, we're pro immigration, but we, we do need to have some border security. And then there would be debates on what that would look like and how it would be involved and whether or not States could be involved and, and things of that nature. I, I tend to be more on the side of, a country without secure borders, <laughs> that's problematic. So why do you think they're all wrong? Because I think each one of them go have the, I think each one of them tend to go too far in one direction or the other. The, the Bush Romney wing just doesn't work because it's fake. I, I don't think they really care. I think all they really care about is making sure that the U S chamber of commerce is happy on with their immigration policy. And then they'll give, you know, again, they'll, they'll fund some stuff for the drug war because they, they feel like that's an easy way to, you know, fight the battle. Um, the right wing populism, I think to some, I think has a tendency to go to anti-immigration and, and that's the part I have a problem with. I think immigration can actually be an incredibly positive thing. Um, the, the, the real question is, is okay, why are people to come to the country? So the argument that I've always used is that if you actually wanted more immigration, the way that you would have to go about achieving that is that you would, you would have to make the process for immigrating legally to the United States easier, and you would have to drastically remove all of these government-sponsored goodies. So yeah. the, the real question from immigration is, and this is the one area what I, I would hope that everyone could agree on. The real question with immigration on whether or not it's positive or negative is based entirely on what's the motivation for coming. If the motivation for coming to the United States is, I love what the United States represents. I love the idea that you guys have property rights and that a person can work really hard and they don't have to be constantly living in fear of their government um, because it's it's too invasive or, um, you know, crime and, and cartels because the government is completely ineffective and corrupt. Like if you're coming for those reasons and it's all because I see something in America that I absolutely love and want to be a part of and I want to build up and that is a net positive for the country. If someone comes to the United States because it's like I can make more money working over here plus they have all these social benefits and goodies that, that I'm, I'm able to get for free, that's a negative impact. So my, my policy on this is personally, I think that um, we should have open on un, uh, open borders unlimited immigration from china north korea <laughs> laos cuba venezuela yeah. um vietnam <laughs> any country with a left wing socialist or marxist dictatorship we should just accept unlimited immigration from total open borders if you're coming from uh the uk new zealand australia the Scandinavian countries, Germany, I don't want you. Um, I, 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 because the more left-wing, woke, progressive your country is, yeah. the less likely I'm going to want to to import you in. But if you're coming, if you're trying to flee a Marxist regime, oh, I want you. Yeah. I, I want you. In fact, I, actually, I'd be willing to do a trade. Yeah. Um, because well, was, My ideal immigration policy would be to set it up very, very simply. All the people in this country that would love to try real socialism can trade places with somebody that's desperately trying to flee a country trying real socialism. I would take that one for one trade and I, I, two for one. I'll take it however you want to, however you want to do that one. I, I will gladly take it. I, I want to get to some, Bastiat here makes a good point. He goes foreign aid is opening the door to embezzlement. So, so Bastiat, I, I, again, I tend to agree with the foreign aid. I think there's, there's, 
is there certain times and places where foreign aid can be appropriate? Yes, potentially. Um, I, I tend to think that aid for like a disaster and stuff like that is actually better if it comes in the form of charitable donation from private citizens rather than from governments. But but can there be places where foreign aid can be appropriate? I, I will say in a very, very limited uh, scope it can be because what Bastiat says in this is correct. In fact, there's a joke that what foreign aid really is, is it's a wealth transfer from poor people in rich countries to rich people in poor countries. And and if you look at all the foreign aid that has gone into the third world, you see a lot of that taking place where foreign aid is, is basically captured by whatever political elite has the most guns in the country at the time. And then it is only distributed in such a way as to prop up the ruling regime. So uh, all this, so much foreign aid is actually not only not lifted third world countries out of poverty. It's actually contributed to them languishing in poverty because it's been administered by corrupt governments. So I, I want to make sure I'm very, very clear on that. I have a huge problem with foreign aid and in, in, in most 95% of foreign aid. Um, I, I have a real hard time with the way it's administered. So just wanted to make sure that nobody was thinking, oh man, Nick's gone soft on us, wants to give oh, US the, tax dollars to everybody. The, the, the last group of people that I want unlimited immigration from is um, anybody from Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah, they they they, they get they, they yeah. actually probably get top priority because they were flying American flags and saying yeah. things like we need a Second Amendment in Hong Kong. And, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. So, All so. Right, we got two more categories to go through. <laughs> healthcare. What would healthcare look like? I think under right wing populism, uh, healthcare would be more free. You probably you probably still have some sort of social safety net. Um, but I, I'm not. I'm not sure what major change they they would obviously get rid of like Obamacare and things like that. But I think they would. I think they would still keep a lot of the other major uh, safety nets. Uh, Romney and Bush, you, <laughs> they wouldn't change anything. <laughs> they wouldn't change anything except they'd probably expand the the government systems that are already taken in place, and they'd try to give a they they try to give better deals for you know big business within the process. Uh, the the Liberty Wing would definitely go for uh, more of a, a private sector. Um, approach to healthcare, uh, and, and I and I I count myself firmly in that camp with that as well. Uh, for everybody that tells me like, oh, but what about what about energy care? What about the people that can't look? I, I think there's mechanisms that we can actually use to to ensure that. But here's what I've seen over time with the political process: the more the government is in charge of providing a wealth transfer program or a welfare program, the bigger incentive they have to expand the number of people that qualify for the program. So it always starts off. It always starts off with a sector of the population that the vast majority of us look at, feel an enormous amount of sympathy for, or just understand that practically, how are you going to do this? And that's how they always justify the government intervention into a particular industry. And then it always ends up with them trying, the government trying to control that industry or expand the number of people because it works for political math. It doesn't work for healthcare math. It doesn't work for economic math. It doesn't work for the efficient. Um, you know, distribution of resources math, but it always works for political math. And that's why I'm very, very skeptical. It's not because I'm a cold hearted human being that want people to die or, or anything like that. It's because I think long term, we're in a far better position when we allow the market economy to function. And then we allow charitable institutions to actually do their work um, effectively. There is a person in the comments, fly guy nine, who brings up a really important point. And I know Christian's going to really like this. Um, he says, "By the way, did did we forget about aliens? <laughs> what 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 do you, you know? What Hamilton, what, you are no are you longer sure going to be referring to like illegal aliens rather than <laughs> well, like the UFO. There's been a lot of talk about UFOs oh and everything. Gosh. What's the Nick? What's the what's? Give us the breakdown of the difference between the three positions on the right when it comes to UFOs and aliens. The, the right wing populist <laughs> side is going to be worried about them, you know, coming in and interfering with us economically and militarily. The Bush Romney wing will subsidize their transport here, and the Liberty <laughs> wing just wants to know if they've got any good things They'll, to trade. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> The, the Liberty Wing is going to be like, hey, are you having flights off planet? Can I? <laughs> are you giving us an out? Like, yeah. are... <laughs> All right. Final one. Final one. Energy policy. Energy policy. All right. So with with uh, Trump and, and the right wing populist side or, or and I, I, I tend to put DeSantis and Trump kind of both in the right wing populist side. I think that Trump is more populist and, and DeSantis is more uh, traditional conservative, but I think they're both kind of in, in that camp. Um, I don't think there's a huge difference between their overall policy positions. I think Christian disagrees with me on some of it, but right wing populist side, what do they do with energy? Uh, I think they, I, I think it's an all hands on deck. I think they would cut a lot of the government subsidization of green energy policies, which I actually think is a good policy. Uh, but I do think they would subsidize a lot of domestic, 
um, energy production. They would and subsidize I, oil and natural gas and stuff they like would, that. They would look at it as a as a strategic industry that needs government protection and subsidization. And that, that's the part where I would I tend to disagree with them. Uh, but I, I think that's what they would do. I think the Romney and, and Bush side. They subsidize everything. They subsidize everything. <laughs> they subsidize everything. This is this is about political math for them more than it is anything else. Um, and, and I'm sure they'd get us involved in some sort of war based off of energy requirements somewhere. Uh, the Liberty side basically says we're going to remove restrictions. They would do we're, the exact opposite of the Bush Romney wing. Yeah. They, what they would essentially say is like, look, we, we do. Energy is obviously important. Um, I, I don't think they privatize everything overnight or anything like that, but I do think what they what they move toward is the idea that it's not our job to subsidize, but it's also we're also going to uh, significantly deregulate to make it easier to actually break into the energy sector. Um, the the one area that I think would surprise people that always look at the Liberty View toward energy and say, oh, so I'm just going to be able to put an oil well in my subdivision, right? <laughs> like, no, uh, the li- the Liberty people do believe in such a thing as trespass. Um, so while they would stand up for property rights and they would allow for more drilling, more exploration, more things like that, if you polluted in such a way that negatively impacted other people, they would actually allow for the, the legal system uh, to adjudicate those things and ensure that people were properly compensated. And the fact that they would be able to sue in court in order to get damages would have a would have a moderating effect on the way that people actually did involve in exploration, refining, drilling, things like that. Because again, if you're going to have to pay out a huge settlement to somebody that you you know destroyed their property, that's going to make sure that you actually put in to effect certain safety procedures and things of that nature. So, but that that's what it would be. I don't think they would. They certainly wouldn't subsidize all this green energy stuff. Um, they would they would say, look, there's a huge demand for energy, and we're going to let the marketplace essentially and, meet it. I mean, Thomas Massey even drives a Tesla and has manufactured his own charging systems at his house based off of solar. But in no way does he support the government incentivizing or yeah. funding any of this technology being built. Yeah. Well, it was in a, even Elon Musk when he was asked about, well, of course the government has to, you know, create these charging stations in order to encourage green energy. He's like, no, you don't. Yeah. He's like, why? He goes, did we do that with gas stations? You know, when, when Henry, when Henry Ford started making the model T and all of a sudden cars were, were becoming more and more popular, did the government have to come in and come up with like government gas station? Yeah. No, he goes, you don't got to do the same thing with charging stations. He's abs- it, it, this is the part where, again, it is so easy and convenient to imagine a world where, oh, here's a need, government, go meet that need. The problem is, is that it, government operates off of political incentives. And so it's always going to be inefficient because they're not spending their own money. They have their, their, their chief goal is to get reelected, not cr- come up with the best solution. Um, and by the way, they can get reelected decade after decade by making stupid decisions as long as they've marketed it well and picked somebody else to blame when it goes wrong. I'm telling you right now, if Tesla fails to produce something, they can blame whoever they want. Their shareholders are taking out their money and sending it elsewhere. This is why you want the majority of decisions in the private sector. It's not because the people in the private sector are, are just wonderful you know, people all the time and none of them are motivated by greed. The difference is the power to which they can subsidize their greed and the power to which they can hide themselves from the consequences of their greed. You have, you have far more ability to negatively impact a company, which is doing something bad than you do a politician. You, you can convince yourself that that vote you take every two, four, six years is just the scariest thing on the planet to that politician. But I will tell you right now, it, the moment you stop doing business with somebody, you've already voted. You've already voted and you get to vote every single day when it comes to your, your private sector transactions. I'm sorry, that's a lot better and a lot more efficient not, in most cases. Not to get too far off subject, yeah. but part, one of the concerns with electric charging was that all of these companies, GM, Tesla, Ford, would have each of their own individual stations across the country, and it would just be super crowded. Yeah. But Tesla has done a fantastic job of installing these in good locations and keeping them up and running, and GM, Ford, and Rivian has, have announced over the last two weeks that they are all going to adopt Tesla's connector and start using Tesla system yeah. because they've been doing it so well. Yeah. Um, Valerie so sh- asked a question about what, um, who, who would support nuclear out of those three groups uh, or, or would all of them? Question. So I, I think, I, I think actually think all three of them would. Um, I, I think all three of them would because, because nu- nuclear is, um, I, I mean, it is uh, overall 
pound for pound. Like this is the, the, the amount of output that you have with it and everything else. It, it is the safest, most efficient, most effective way to provide energy to people. It, there's so much fear mongering around it. But when you actually, st- here's a fun, here's a fun fact about statistics. When you think about the number of deaths, um, compare, you know, by, by energy producing, yeah. you know, um, function. So, you know, think of like a coal power plant versus a nuclear power plant versus windmills versus, yeah. um, hydroelectric, the deadliest form of energy, con- um, of, of, of energy construction, um, of, of anywhere in the world is actually hydroelectric. Oh, really? Right. Well, dams. Yeah. Because like, um, dams collapsing? They're, they're, dam failures. Yeah. Um, there, there, there's been a couple of cases in China in the 20th century of hydroelectric dams failing. And when they fail, like people think that, like, oh, when a nuclear power plant fails, it can kill a lot of a lot of people, like Chernobyl. Yeah. When a hydroelectric dam, especially in like the Yellow River Valley or Yangtze River Valley, fails, hundreds of thousands yeah. can die and millions can lose their homes. Yeah. There's actually a case in China. I cannot remember the the year off the top of my head, but of of, of a dam failing, and it was the largest amount of deaths ever related to a form a specific form of energy production anywhere yeah and nobody would ever think about that that like dams you know hydroelectric would be the most dangerous statistically speaking yeah nuclear is one of the least dangerous actually notwithstanding things like fukushima and chernobyl and stuff like that nuclear actually has a very long track record of being one of the safest forms of energy production yeah that exists let me so there's a question from shannon rice question what about companies like dupont who would rather eat the lawsuit than do things more safely so the way that you actually get around that is the lawsuits become easier to win and far more costly to the company and and it it is in many respects. In fact, if you look at a lot of the regulations, regulations are not just written to require companies to produce things more safely. Regulations can also be written to essentially give them cover, legal cover, as long as they follow the government guidelines. And so we, we see this as a problem with things like catalytic converters is, is kind of a really popular example of this, where the auto industry in the United States used the catalytic converter in order to meet government regulations with respect to smog reduction. Well, it turns out that there was other systems that actually worked better than catalytic converters, but the car lobby in the United States lobbied the government to require catalytic converters. Well, what happened? Well, foreign com- foreign cars that were coming over that were actually better with respect to the environmental issue had to you know, put in catalytic converters. So th- this becomes an, an issue where, again, there are times where the government can accidentally screw up and get it right, <laughs> right? But there's there's far more likely that they're going to get it wrong or as time and technology changes, they're not keeping up with it. So one of the ways that, that we we look to solve this within government or they, they look to solve this within government is to say things like, okay, we're not going to tell you how to do it, but we're going to tell you that you got to reduce the overall smog. And so they could do that with like a Pagovian tax. That's what uh, essentially cap and trade were and things like that. The, the reason why I, I think the civil action, um, it, it can be problematic. Again, please understand there's no solutions here. There's only trade-offs. There's only trade-offs. The, the trade-off within the civil action side, um, the, the benefit to it is you can make the lawsuits so painful for a company that is doing something, you know, deliberately wrong or doing something that is uh, deliberately unsafe to where they have to modify, but they're able to modify in, in ways that are best practices, not just simply government mandates, right? Cause, cause OSHA creates a huge cost to American consumers with the way that they hold up projects, the things that they require. And some of the restrictions you would look at with OSHA and say, Oh yeah, that makes sense. Other ones you look at me like, this is ridiculous. Why is this even in here? Because a union wanted it. And a union didn't want it because it was safer. A union wanted it because it allowed people to actually, you know, do like multiple jobs within the same work week or whatever it was. So again, important to understand how the political process gets manipulated with this. Um, that's not to say that other processes can't be manipulated. But if we're, we're asking what would be the liberty approach to this, it would probably be to say to uphold property rights. And when there's a trespass, uh, to be able to make sure that the person that is suing the larger company um, has a legal system that is going to efficiently work for them to make sure that they can get restitution. And that restitution over time, especially when you have like class action lawsuits, can definitely compel a company to to work differently. Now, are there some cases where you would still need, um, you know, potential laws or regulation? Sure. Uh, but the emphasis one on the liberty side would be uh, protecting property rights and protecting against trespass, not trying to micromanage how a business would go about doing things in a more safe way or environmentally friendly way. 
want, I have a comment I'd like to bring up here uh, from So Untouchable. I think it's important to note that there is an establishment wing and a populist wing of both parties, but only Republicans have a liberty wing. And my thoughts on that were on, on the right, we have Republicans, conservatives, liberty minded Republicans and libertarians. But on the left, we have Democrats, um, liberals, maybe socialist Democrats, yeah. socialist and communists. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, that the right is the only one that has a liberty wing? Um, you know, it's interesting the the left, the less used to be um, more pro liberty on certain things. And, and you're starting to see kind of like what they call the intellectual dark web and things like that. There's been some pushback, like Bill Maher has kind of pushed back against the censorship component and things like that. So typically you, you had a left wing that um, might have been good at one point on things like civil liberties uh, or free speech. But even then, it was always in relation to the government. Right. If, if you look at it, it's like, why do they want free speech? Well, it's because they believe that certain groups were underrepresented within the government. They wanted to pull them into the government because it meant more political power. OK, you know, why, um, you know, wh why emphasis on more political power? Well, because it would allow them to be able to get the sort of legislation passed that would allow for either more subsidies or a different tax code or things like that. So I, I think the, the basis of left-wing ideology is rooted in the idea of the collective, the collective over the individual. Well, if, if you're rooted in the collective over the individual, even though true Marxists will say that the end state of true Marxism is no government at all because you just have a dictatorship of the proletariat, okay, that's cute, but you're, you're still going to have somebody determining who gets what uh, on, on what circumstance. The, the far end of the spectrum on the, on the liberty side, whether you want to call it anarcho-capitalism or, or whatever, um, puts the emphasis first on the individual. Now, that doesn't mean the liberty side doesn't care about, quote, the collective or the, or the body as a whole. It just recognizes that in order for anybody to have rights, everybody has to have certain rights at the individual level, right? You, you can't have group rights, but not individual rights. Um, and so that's why I believe the left-wing ideology always, always favors or always ends up pushing toward more government control because the collective determines the, the collective is the primary concern and democratic processes are what they consider to be the morally correct way for the collective to decide what's best. Um, but on the right, again, if, if anything that starts off with the value of individual liberty, again, that's not selfishness. It's just the understanding that rights have to start with the individual you're going to get varying degrees of what they think the government should be doing within that spectrum, but it still goes back to the rights of the individual. And so I don't think you're ever going to see, um, I, I think the very nature of it means that you're not going to see an emphasis on the individual on the, um, on the left. Uh, you can see it in the right. However, there's also versions of the right wing, which do not place a great deal. They might respect the rights of the individual, but then you'll see the same kind of collective approach in certain right wing movements where it becomes all about the nation. Um, so, and that's the part where I think it kind of, it, it bleeds over and stops being right wing, even though there's certain components of it, which are associated with the right things like respect for country or, um, you know, respect for the military or, or things like that. Um, those things end up being co-opted. So I, I, and, and again, libertarians would come in and say, well, no, that's because there's actually four components here and it's, you know, a, a authority, anarchy, you know, conservative. And, and they, they would look at it a little bit differently in the way that they organize that, that thought. But uh, that's the best way I can answer the question. I, I think the left always starts with the collective. I think, um, you know, at least the, the liberty wing on the right starts with the individual. All right, we've got another question. What would be the stance on foreign governments or entities purchasing large properties in the U.S.? So we actually had this topic come up um, in Virginia this year. Um, I, I voted to prevent uh, not only China but other countries which were openly hostile to the United States from being able to buy large uh, portions of property. The, the question is always going to get into um, differentiating between a foreigner buying property and a foreign government buying property. And so one of the things that that – we try to look at on here is that it, it's not as if we want to eliminate any sort of foreign connected entity or foreign individual or foreign business from owning anything in the United States. That's not what we're trying to do. However, when you have a foreign government, which is openly hostile to the United States, 
<laughs> saying that you or your closely affiliated entities, so you have a state-run economy for the most part in China, are are, per, are uh, prevented from purchasing large. I think that just makes sense. Would that also apply to companies? So, for example, in China, there's a lot of state-run companies yes, or companies that are, are effectively state-run companies. Yes, it does. That was the differentiation that was made. Is like you, you can have someone that might be a Chinese national that that owns something in the United States that you know might not. And, and this is the part where, again, there's there's nuance involved. Um, some people would say, nope, I don't think anybody of uh, anybody, any foreign entity should be able to own any property in the United States. Okay, well, do you want that reciprocated? Should no U.S. citizen or company be able to own anything in a foreign country? I, I think there's, there's problems with that. Um, I do think it makes sense, and that's the way that we looked at it. Originally, it started off with China, but then we looked at a whole list of nations that were openly hostile to the United States, and we said, yeah, we're not going to let these governments or government-affiliated entities within that you know, to be able to purchase yeah. large swaths of I, land. Nuance is necessary because I'm I'm not at all against foreign investment. In fact, foreign investment is a really good thing because the yeah. United States is considered a stable economy that people around the world, companies around the world want to invest in. Consider the fact that Elon Musk was not a natural born American citizen. Yeah. Right. He eventually got American citizenship and, and it's a good thing. I would absolutely argue that it is a good thing that we allowed somebody like Elon Musk to come here, get American citizenship and invest money in this country. Sure. And, and so there's, there has to be a, a difference between making it still easy for foreign investors to park their money and resources in this country to our benefit yeah. and allowing a foreign adversary to gain a foothold in the United States that they can then use for nefarious purposes, potentially maybe like spying or espionage, either at a, at a, a government or corporate level. Um, so yeah, you're totally right that like some nuance is necessary on that issue. So the, we got one other question on this one. Um, uh, what happens when a formerly non-hostile country becomes a hostile country to those people then be grandfathered in owning property or would they have to give up their property? Uh, so that ends up being a legal question, both at the state and federal level. And it tends to be again, who's owning it. So in, in understand that the vast, vast, vast majority of foreign investment in the United States is not owned by foreign governments as much as it is by foreign companies or or foreign uh, people who who are who are able to purchase property, and and again, if you go over to foreign countries, there's a, a huge amount of of companies, factories, land that might be owned by U.S. businesses or U.S. individuals. Um, so the the distinction is generally made when when we're looking at law, state or federal, generally made when we're talking about a state-run institution. Now, if an individual uh, finds themselves in a situation where they've run afoul in the United States, either usually by by breaking the law or engaging in terrorist activity or something like that. They can have assets seized as a result of breaking U.S. law. But um, but if you had a situation where let's say <laughs> let, uh, let me come up with it. let's say Morocco, right? And for anybody watching from Morocco, I'm not trying to pick on Morocco. I was just picking a name. Let's say Morocco, um, the Moroccan government had owned some property through a state-run business in the United States, and then all of a sudden that country you know, turn hostile to the United States. Could they have their, their, um, their land or their resources seized? Yeah, they could. They just would have had to violate some sort of U S law. And, and typically the way we, we do that is associated with either active aggressive military operations or some sort of violation of, of U S or international law for which the U S has a treaty. Okay. I am going to go ahead and, and kind of wrap this up now. I think we've had a good, robust conversation. Love all the questions. My gosh. We Chat have, was awesome. We have today. the best audience. We have the best audience. Listen, this episode, actually the last two episodes we did, came at the request of one of our members in Circle. And we've got a lineup of other requests that we're looking to do to it on a wide range of topics. So if you want to be involved in that process of not only engaging in the conversation during the uh, live stream, but also deciding what sort of topics we're going to hit in the future. Joining Circle is a great way to do that. We want to thank everybody that participated today. Let me give kind of the, the overall wrap up. I think it is important to recognize that um, the left is kind of, I think, largely decided the general direction they want to go. And it's really a question of speed. I don't think it's even so much a question of, of scope as much anymore. Um, there will be some that, you know, yeah, there's always going to be that element within the left that wants to go full on, seize the means of production. Uh, and then there's going to be other elements of the left like, ah, we don't want to seize it all, but we do want to have a massive say in the way it's controlled, right? And that's where we, we drew that distinction between what we call socialist economic policy versus fascist economic policy. And we always do the disclaimer. When we say fascist, we don't mean Nazi. We just mean, if you look at the fascist manifesto coming out of Italy in the in the um, you know, and, and the, this thought that was developing in the 20s and early 30s, right, that that fascist economic system was 
you still had some degree of private ownership, but large scale government controlled cartelization, um, you know, labor and, and everything else. And, and we saw how FDR attempted to do a lot of those same policies within the United States during the Great Depression, which actually made it worse. So we, we think the left is kind of moving in that general collectivist approach, no matter how you slice it. In the right, we have a huge debate going on right now. Um, and, and I think I, we try to do a fair job of, of breaking this down by the various categories that we have between more of the right-wing populism, which I think is kind of merged in, in some respects with the traditional conservative, uh, traditional conservatism. And then we have kind of like the big government Republicanism that you see, you know, from the Bush, uh, Bush wing, Romney wing of the party. And then you have that, that Liberty wing, which we think is represented largely by Massey, Rand Paul, Mike Lee guys, guys like that. Um, the real question here is, you know, who do we think is most likely to win? And um, I, I think Christian and I would probably agree on this. We, we both generally associate ourselves more with the liberty wing of the party. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't things that we agree with um, in, in, other, in other areas. But that's, that's where I consider myself. I'm, I'm camped right there. And I think the reason why it uh, has been so difficult for the liberty wing to actually gain in, in real prominence is for something that Christian always likes to bring up. And that's the, the people who want to win will usually beat the people who just want to be left alone. And so we have to do a better job in the Liberty Wing of actually talking about why we, why we want the systems in place that we do and why we think it would be effective and try to look to make the gains where we possibly can. I think education is a really exciting field for the Liberty Wing of the party right now. I think there's going to be other areas on regulation uh, and taxes where we can play a major role. Um, but it looks like the battle is, is largely between the, the Romney um, what I would call the, the Romney Bush wing and what I would call more the Trump DeSantis wing. The populist wing will win. They've already won. Yeah. But the, the, the question is what type well, they, of... They'll, they'll win. I think they're going to win within the Republican side of the House. Well, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. The question is, I, will on, they be able to... On that front, you, know. you already know my opinion on that. I think we're totally doomed. <laughs> yeah. But but like, I mean, not totally doomed. Doomed short term and medium term, not long term. I'm actually quite optimistic long term once we actually get to the inevitable <laughs> debt crisis. But um, it, it, it's... It's interesting because in some ways, like Nick and I are a minority within a minority, <laughs> if you think about it, right? Because yeah. the Liberty Wing is, and again, Nick pointed it out that like we don't agree with the Liberty Wing on everything. We, I just probably there's some things that are a little bit more nuanced. Like for example, yeah. I obviously do not agree with them on the education stuff, yeah. but like, um, and I somewhat don't agree with them on the foreign policy stuff, but on the economic stuff. On some of the other domestic related stuff, uh, we're totally and on the monetary yeah. stuff, fiscal yeah. stuff, totally in agreement. But um, I, I, I do think it's interesting that like the Liberty Wing is the smallest of these three factions within the conservative movement and certainly within the Republican Party. And likewise, you know, I've argued before that, well, the conservative movement and certainly the Republican Party is, is they're the out party. Conservatives outnumber liberals in the United States, but that doesn't mean that conservatism. Yeah has any sort of dominant control over government or culture or, or, or really anything. Well, and, and to, to your point, so we're a minority within a minority. Yeah. And to your point, it is, it is so much easier. It is so much easier oftentimes to be able to just make the fight all about who controls government. And the, the thing that we, we've, we've tried to articulate on this, on this show is you have to participate in the, in the politics side. You have to participate in the government side. Obviously, they're making important decisions which are going to affect you whether you like it or not, so you got to participate. However, one of the best ways to fight back is to push for alternatives so that when somebody says, well, if the government didn't do it, who would? You can answer that question through yourself, your family, your church, civic organizations, and you can demonstrate that what we're talking about is it's not crazy. This isn't pie-in-the-sky stuff. Right, this, 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 <laughs> there's a longstanding tradition that this this approach to not only government but society and making sure that we don't conflate the two. Government is not society. Government may play a role in society, but it isn't society itself. And so we should continue to fight not only to expose the lie of what is being perpetuated, but to actually show people the truth through practical alternatives that they can understand, appreciate, and be involved in. Once again, thank you very much for joining us. Consider joining the Circle Group, and we'll see you next episode.